Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board from Monday, November 8th, 2021. This is Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan. Yes, thank you. John Hurd. Yes. Len Diggins. Yes, Mr. Chair, and just in case things get a little intense, I got some protection tonight. Nice. <laughs> Eric Helmuth. Yes, thank you. Uh, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine. Yes. Doug Heim. Yes. And Board Administrator Ashley Marr is participating remotely. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act signed into law on June 16th, 2021, that extends certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. The act includes an extension until April 1, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, let me offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find out how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. Finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. Once again, we have a full agenda this evening, so let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. I'll now turn to item two on the agenda, which is the fiscal 2022 first quarter budget update. Sandy Pooler, Deputy Town Manager, and Edie, Ada Cody, I'm sorry, Comptroller. All right, they should both be joining us in one second. Good evening, Mr. Pooler and Ms. Cody. Good evening. Thank you. I think uh, we'll have Ida make the presentation tonight. Great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ida Cody, and I'm the town controller. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the year to date budget tonight. Um, this is the expense and revenue report for the first quarter of the fiscal year 22 and with September 30th, 2021. Um, I don't know if I have CND's presentation skills, but I can assure you that I will have the same numbers for you tonight. Um, I know that this board is familiar with um, the report, but I will still um, briefly explain the format just in case there is someone in the audience that hasn't watched this, um, hasn't seen this report before. So the first, the report is structured on three parts. The first part is the a narrative part where we explain the variances between the um, estimated and actual expenses. Um, for the, the end of the um, first quarter, the, the burn rate for the expenditures should be at 25% and the revenue collection should be also at 25%. However, um, when we get to the departments, you will see that there are variances and I'll cover them as we look at each department. The second part of the report is a summary table of all the revenue expenditures by departments or by category. <clears throat> this is a high level summary, summary that makes it easier for you to follow the total expenditures and the expense rate or the revenue collection by department. And uh, finally, uh, we have the MUNIS report, which is a direct printout from MUNIS, which is 
a lot more detailed and not as easy as to follow. However, if you're interested in looking at the salaries or a certain line item, you have it here. Um, one note before I uh, dive into the report is that we still have COVID expenses <clears throat> in the general fund. And this is because we haven't received the final drawdown of the CARES funds. However, we did get the approval letter last week that uh, the, the state approved our uh, final request. And once we get the cash, we will reclassify these expenses out of the general fund to free up the free cash and bring the budgets in line with the rate where they are supposed to be and charge these expenses to the um, COVID fund. Um, Mr. Chapdelin, yes, I will skip the narrative and I will dive right into the summary where we can look at the actual variances. <clears throat> the first variance that I have here is for the um, information technology. It looks like they've spent 36% of their budget. Um, however, they paid and uh, encumbered their software and network licenses in the beginning of the fiscal year. So this is not alarming. This is um, okay. Uh, it's, it's normal. We usually encourage department to pull purchase orders in the beginning of the year to secure funding and make sure we don't have surprises at the end of the fiscal year by having um, uh, goods ordered or services and not having enough funding. The second uh, department that's high is the facilities and it's the same um, situation. Uh, it's because they encumbered most of their contracted services, uh, mostly for cleaning and utilities, the electric and gas. The next department that's uh, burning high is the DPW. Um, they're showing that they've spent 48.6 the salaries there are, are they're okay they're at 25 percent however due to the encumbrances uh, this distorts a little bit their department it shows that they're at half um, like I said uh, they encumber for the solid waste for utilities for trim, uh, trees trimming and a lot of other um, contracted services the next department that's high is the board of health there are three reason why, reasons why the Board of Health is high. Um, one, of them, one of them is the rent. They're paying $60,000 rent at the beginning of the fiscal year. We actually paid in July. Um, they also paid the mosquito control assessment in August. And um, there is a payroll error between Board of Health and DEI. Um, the staff uh, at uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion was charged in error to the Board of Health, but we rectified that. And when we present the second quarter of this fiscal year, um, you should see it back to normal on both departments. The next uh, department is the Council on Aging, and it's the same reason the, the encumbrances of the contracted services and also uh, at the um, rent payment, which takes place in July. Um, veteran services, they're encumbering um, the veterans benefits uh, at the end of the, uh, the beginning of the fiscal year. And um, that's about it. Just the library is at about 29% and that's just because she has some, they have some encumbrances. This are the expenditures for departments. The next category is the non-department um, budgets. Um, the first one is the transfers. This comprises of the transfers out that we post at the beginning of the fiscal year. That's why it, it appears that it's being spent 100%. Um, we transfer the subsidies to the enterprise. Uh, we post the capital projects uh, and the transfers to the state stabilization uh, on July 1st. The debt is at 40%. Um, and this is uh, really, we don't have much to say on this. We follow the uh, Hilltop Securities um, debt schedule. Um, the payment of this bond um, is due on the anniversary of the bond sales. So um, the treasurer just pays the invoices as they come. 
the pensions is um, at 100% because the treasurer transfers the um, wires the money um, in the in July and the funds get invested in the beginning of the fiscal year. The liability insurance is at 65%. 64.5 uh, because we pay the, um, the town insurance um, invoices in July. If you could, yeah. The next category is the articles. Um, this don't necessarily have to be at 25%. We usually give departments and various uh, committees and commissions um, two years to spend these funds. There are two exceptions here. Um, one is the indemnification, which gets paid in um, July and appears that it's all spent. Uh, we're paying the, we're reimbursing the medical costs for the retired police and um, officers. Um, the next and the um, maintenance of town water bodies. Um, this transfer takes place um, in July. We transfer the whole amount into a special fund um, where uh, the DPW spends it as they need it. And that concludes the expenses for the general fund. Moving on to the revenues, um, the first line shows the transfers. Um, we bring in um, the indirect costs, which is the offsets from the, uh, the enterprise funds. Um, we also post here the override stabilization and the um, other um, operating, all the operating and capital offsets. Um, we usually take care of all the articles, all the transfers in the first month of the fiscal year. The property taxes um, are at 24%. They're right on target. Um, we did um, um, issue the preliminary and we accounted for the um, debt exclusion. For, uh, we included the debt exclusion for the high school in the preliminary so people will not have um, large increases when they get the actual bills. Um, the, the motor vehicle excise. Um, it, this is high for the first quarter, and this is not for this fiscal year. This is collections for the prior fiscal years. The uh, commitment, the, the billing for um, fiscal year 22 will take place in the third quarter uh, when we receive the information from the Department of Motor Vehicles and we issue the bills. Um, the next uh item that's high is the um the fees um the fees uh are appear to be i mean they are higher than 25 percent because we have three categories that exceeded the 25 percent um one is the ambulance the ambulance payments um are strong this year um in the first quarter at least um also the parking revenue has picked up this year as a result of COVID not being that strict anymore. Um, but keep in mind that we reduced the estimate. We originally had 350 and we lowered it down to $200,000. So that what this is what makes it um, look higher. Also the clerk's office, the town clerk's office is at 43%. And this is uh, mainly from the vital records that they're now required for um, for the real IDs. The next line is uh, the licenses and permits. And this is mostly because the economy came back um, and this clearly shows the strong economy. Um, we had uh, strong revenues from the um, building permits, wire, um, electric, um, also, um, it's worth mentioning that the inspections director um, is asking the uh, contractors to sign an affidavit to attest the true value of the work they're doing, which 
is only helping us by collecting more money. Um, the, the school medical aid is low, is only 18%. Um, However, this fluctuates every year. So the next two quarters could be a, a much larger. We've had quarters when we had 55,000, other quarters when we had 23. So um, we hope to get to the $100,000, maybe even more. Um, pilot, um, this is the payments in lieu of taxes. Uh, we collect payments from uh, two locations for two schools. Um, their agreement says that they have until um, July 1st to pay it. So we'll keep an eye. Um, it might not show up on the second quarter. They usually come in late. Um, hotel, meals, and marijuana tax. These are the excise tax. And uh, we made some changes here. Uh, first, we changed the estimate originally, and, and I'll start with the hotel. So for the hotel motel, the original estimate was $325,000. And we lowered it based on experience and based on the current um, revenues collected. Um, so we made it $170,000. That brought it to 47%. Uh, the meals tax was originally at $300,000 $300, and we decided to increase it again based on experience, based on actual revenues, and we got to 31%. Marijuana was originally 194 dollars and we bumped it to $239,000. This is a good revenue source. People want to be happy and we we're strong in this area. Um, the impact of these changes in the, uh, the changes of this um, estimates did, is, is zero. It's not, uh, did not result in any, uh, in an increase on the total estimated revenue. And the last item I have here is the interest, which is low for two reasons. One, um, we only posted July and August. We haven't finished the bank reconciliation for September. So you only see two months reflected, not three. And also the interest rates plummeted. Um, we don't see those um, high revenues as we're accustomed to. And that's about it for the general funds. And I will move on to the enterprise funds. The first enterprise fund is the water and sewer. The expenses um, are high for two reasons. Once we encumber the funds for the contracted services, and second, we post all the offsets, all the indirect costs budgeted in general fund, we post it at the beginning of the fiscal year. So it, it, it looks like they are um, expensing at a higher rate. Um, the revenue on the other side, it's on the other hand, um, is right at where it's supposed to be at 24%. And we also posted the general fund subsidy. So in total, it's at 30%, but really the actual user charges are only at 24%. And this is consistent with where it should be at the end of the first quarter. AYCC enterprise um, is okay. It's at 25% both revenue and expenditures. Um, council on aging. Council on aging is lower on expenses and they also have encumbrances, but they don't show a lot of revenues. The reason is, well, we did, we, we did post the subsidy on, in July, but also council on aging uh, Council on Aging got a lot of donations this year as a result of COVID. So they've been running their transportation services through the donation funds. So both revenue and expenses will be outside from the donation, from the donated um, funds. The ring fund um, is at 38% and for the same thing for two reasons. One is the offsets, the indirect costs are posted in July. 
and also they encumbered $98,000. Absent of these encumbrances, but with offsets included, they would have been at 21%. So they're in good shape, the expense, expense wise. The revenue is weak, but that's because this is seasonal and they will start collecting in the in winter months. And finally, the recreation fund. Um, the recreation is at 54% expenses, and this is because um, of the seasonal nature of this fund. They had some um, uh, quite large expenditures um, during summer. They've also encumbered contracted services, and um, we posted the, the indirect uh, costs in July. And the revenue is right where it should be at 26%. And that concludes our summary. And the rest of the report is the a printout from UMIS. Um, Sandy, uh, do you have anything to add? No, you know, I think you did a very thorough, excellent job. Great. Thank you, Ms. Cody, for the presentation, and, and, and thank you, Mr. Pooler. And just to remind people, we had last meeting, we had the year-end update, which is the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. This first quarter update that Ms. Cody just presented is for the period from July 1, 2021 through September 30th, 2021. Sometimes we get confused when we're talking about fiscal year, so... Um, not us, but just uh, in, in, in general, presenting that to the public so people know what time period we're talking about. Um, so I will turn to the board now for questions or comments, and I will start with Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Cody and, and Mr. Fuller for this presentation. I have four brief areas um, of questions. Um, first, um, I would ask um, Ms. Cody or Mr. Pooler, on, on the general fund for public works health department, um, in terms of what, and, and maybe this is for Mr. Pooler, um, working with the town manager, in terms of um, when we file under opera funding uh, to get reimbursed uh, for public works and or health department um, expenditures, is that something with opera funding that you anticipate or feel um, we will be able to use that funding for in terms of the 10 or 11 categories that apply? Um, so we are um, moving forward with our ARPA program as um, demonstrated by the votes of the select board to uh, initially approve uh, certain expenditures. Um, those expenditures in general will be above and beyond what is listed in this report. This report really relates to the budget as passed by town meeting last spring uh, in the general fund. The ARPA spending in general will be over and above that. In the same way that you've seen in the past and Ida referred to certain COVID expenses that we've had, um, that departments have sometimes had to front, but then as we get the fed, federal money in, it goes into a COVID fund. It then disappears from this report. So uh, overall, this report just focuses on the general fund and um, the ARPA and other funding sources uh, will be over and above that. I, I hope that is answering your question. Yes, thank you. Um... My second question is sort of, uh, I'm putting the question out there to um, Mr. Pooler and Ms. Cody, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as Mr. Chaplin, the town manager. Um, if as we move, not if, when we move forward with this um, report and what we received at the last meeting, um, and if it's too cumbersome or exhaustive, then I'm not asking you all to do it, but uh, Mr. Foskett, um, who is the finance committee chairman, but on long range planning, um, he's expressed his own individual views 
um, in terms of town spending, school spending, and um, OPEB funding. And I'm just wondering, I'm really thinking crazy out there, and the chair of long range planning, Mr. DeCourcy, is well aware of these conversations. Um, is there any way that we could sort of track when these reports come in, if on the town side, I, I agree with Mr. Foskett on his recommendations for town school and OPEB, but I also recognize I really can only ask for the town side. I can't speak to the school. That's for our colleagues on school committee. And I can't speak to retirement. That's our colleagues on the retirement board. But um, is there any way to sort of taking Mr. Foskett's individual um, uh, sort of outline on the town side of three to 3.25% when these different categories get reported, if we're in line with that, or if we've gone over that. Well, I don't know, uh, Mr. Poole, if I can start by taking a crack at that, and maybe I'll see if others want to add anything. Um, so uh, what we do try to present in this report is uh, the town budget, again, as I mentioned in my last answer, as voted by town meeting and seeing what progress we make throughout the year to stay within those budgets and to collect the revenue as we've estimated uh, at the time we passed uh, things at town meeting. Now, I've had many conversations as have you, uh, Mrs. Mahan, with Chairman Foskett about our future spending on both the town and school side and what percentages those should go up over time and, and how we count those numbers. That, those are very important conversations. Uh, we continue to have them uh, amongst ourselves and with Mr. Foskett. I would say those conversations were sort of outside of the simple things that this document is trying to, to cover, which is really comparing budget to actual in the current year. Um, those other conversations, I think, really relate more to the long range plan and um, they are important, but probably taken up in a different context. Okay. And, uh, uh, excuse me, Mr. Mahan, I, I, Mr. Chaplain had his hand up on that one as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Ms. Mahan, I, I just wanted to add to Mr. Poole's answer that really fundamentally because town meeting appropriates a town operating budget at three and a quarter percent or lower um we we are we have to be respecting it and what's reported unless we're going over budget so I, I think the it would the marker would be clear when Ida or Sandy would come in and say we're over budget right and that would be the first inkling that we would know we're going beyond that three and a quarter percent. So, so, so long as we are able to report that we are on track with budget, it also simultaneously means that we're on track with the, the restrictions or the requirements of the long range plan. Okay, and I'm um, actually gonna, my last three questions, I'm just only gonna ask one of them because I feel that two of them are more geared towards long range planning and ongoing discussions we'll have <clears throat> but I guess, I don't know if it's to the chair, Mr. DeCourcy, or our town manager, Mr. Chapelain. Um, in terms of the offer reimbursement, um, because I'm, the understanding that I have is because of the debt exclusion with Minuteman, um, that doesn't sort of, and I'm asking if this is correct, if it's not, if you can correct me, if it is, if you could say it more accurately because of opera funding or state COVID funding, because of Minuteman um, debt exclusion and or the high school debt exclusion, um, we may not be able to um, access some funding because we're carrying that on the books. So I don't know if um, Mr. Chaplain or Mr. DeCourcy can speak to that very briefly. I'll, I'll take a crack at it and in this chat point, if you want to add, add on to that, the, the, the baseline for calculating lost revenue under ARPA is calendar year 2019. And we had our debt exclusion and our override in 2019. And those we would almost call extraordinary circumstances 
that pushed up the revenue. So when you compare subsequent revenues in calendar years 20, I'm sure it will be 21 and 22, against that inflated number, it's very difficult um, to show lost revenue given the criteria that's been set out. I think there is a movement to try to get a waiver on that. But Mr. Chapter, if you want to add to that, I, I think that that was my understanding of the dilemma we see ourselves in. Correct, Mr. DeCourcy. You, you just described it uh, accurately. And fortunately, we have still been able to advocate for a regulatory change at Treasury or even a, I don't even know if, it might not even be regulatory, just a guidance change at Treasury that would allow us to benefit from, uh, from that revenue loss or revenue replacement portion of ARPA spending. One other area that I also have heard is um, potentially making its way through Washington and I haven't been able to get clarity on whether or not it was in the infrastructure bill or potentially in what could be the, the later Build Back Better bill would be a change in ARPA eligibility to allow for roadway improvements to be uh, an eligible expenditure under ARPA. Um, so either if we get the rule change to allow us to claim revenue replacement or potentially get the eligibility to be able to make roadway expenditures, either of those happening would allow us a general fund benefit uh, if we operated it or implemented it strategically. So I, we're keeping a close eye on it, um, but right now we cannot get general fund benefit as we see it, or not significant general fund benefit from ARPA, we are gonna take a look at whether or not um, some of the proposed HVAC improvements and parks and playground improvements could uh, uh, provide some capital plan relief, but significant relief from ARPA and the general fund would still await one, one or both of those things that I just mentioned occurring. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you, Mr. Pooler and Ms. Cooler, Ms. Cody, Pooler and Cooler. Mr. Puller and Ms. Cody for uh, providing the um, quarterly budget update. I'm all set, thanks. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. I'll second the motion. Thank you for the very thorough presentation and uh, no comments or questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I mean, thank you, uh, Ms. Cody, for um, an excellent report. Now, I have to say, probably the quote of the night is going to be, people just want to be happy. You know? <laughs> if that's what it takes you know, to, to bring in you know, uh, more money, you know, it's like, do we get the happy people more happy or do we get more people happy? <laughs> so, so, but anyways, you know, uh, as you had mentioned um, um, on, on um, hotel, um, I'm sorry, actually not that one. On um, licenses and permits, we're up 46%. And I'm sure Mr. Jameson will be happy to hear that, you know, part of it is because of the affidavits on, um, uh, on new construction. Uh, but is that 1.7 million, the budget, is that lower than it was in 2019? Have we changed it or, so this is, I'll just stop. I see Mr. Poole is shaking his head. Mr. Puller, do you want to respond to that? Or? Um, I, um, yeah. Ida, you can go ahead. I just, I'm trying to. Uh, well, I, I happen it. to know the answer. Okay. The answer is no, that the, the, the budget number has stayed consistent over the last few years. Oh, okay. So that 40% is, 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 is um, that's, that's, that's very good. Excellent. And, um, and, and um, let me just toggle over and on to my, um, yeah. So the, um, the interest income. As you had mentioned, that um, it is lower than we expect. You know, so so uh, can you uh, give us some sense as to why it's coming in a little lower? Um, so first, we only have two months posted there. You know, September is totally missing, and the reason is because the interest rates are down. Okay, all right. No, because you did you did very uh, you did very well last year in a low interest rate environment, and you, you um, like really outperformed. And I, I just had this thing about interest, you know, and, and so uh, last week or two weeks ago, I had mentioned you know, uh, that there was this $100,000 that um, it was apparently as a general obligation bond anticipation note, and, and it was for the permanent building, and it was only actually for, for three months. And I remember asking the town manager about this, it's like, it, so it was $100,000, a, a, a effective interest rate of 0.055, uh, so about five hundred fifty dollars, 
not a lot of money, of course. But I just remember asking, so so why is it that we had to borrow a hundred thousand dollars? You know, was it just a technical thing? You know, because I mean, yeah, it is only five hundred dollars. You know, but as a big company, I've scout that all day long. You know, uh, uh, so I'm just kind of curious, and and I don't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, so um, if you don't know the answer, we can just talk about it later. But it's just something I can't let go of uh, out of curiosity. And I, for some reason, can't get myself to call you outside of meetings. You don't Ms. Cody or Mr. Puller? Is it about the short term? Yes, the short term. So uh, it was it was issued last year. It was in the meeting, the February 22nd meeting. And, uh, and, and um, it was a three-month bond into support bond anticipation note uh for an apartment building so but it isn't that specific bond itself it's more so the general question i mean so so clearly we've had a case where we've done we a short term long uh, or a small amount of money it, um, and i'm just kind of curious is it like a technical thing that causes us to be an issue a uh, 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 a note me for a short term I mean, no, it's, well it, it's not an ethical uh, uh, issue. It's um, we issued only long term last year. So that was that particular one. I don't know if it was for a, 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 an expense that had to be covered until we went long term. And then we right. turned it and we paid the short paid off the short term and went with long term. Yeah, I, I get that. I understand that. And I, I guess the question is, why is it for like a $100,000? I mean, we need to borrow it? Because it would just seem to me that we would have 100K around. It could just kind of pay it. See, I could understand it if it was like for a few million dollars. I mean, I could see that being like a budget buster. Well, not a budget buster, but it's just something that we don't have it hanging around. So we'd have to issue I me mean, the notes or whatever I mean, for short term in order to get us through to the point where we get the the, the revenue. I'm just trying to understand why this was such a small amount that we needed to issue the note. We, we cannot just use general fund if funds, if, if they're not appropriated. Let's say gotcha. we, we only spend general fund money on whatever was appropriated. We can't just spend on items that haven't been appropriated. Mr. Chaptolin, did you want to add something to that as well? And so, uh, Mr. Diggins. So every year, the Capital Planning Committee really goes uh, to an excruciating level of detail, expenditure by expenditure, project by project, and makes decisions based on the useful life of whatever it is they might be buying or improving or recommending that we buy or improve, and decide whether or not it should be a cash allocation or a borrowing allocation. And it not only is based on the useful life and, and you know whether or not it's actually eligible to be borrowed for, but it's all part of breaking down the capital plan and understanding if we're staying within our 5% of general operating revenue. So strategically to make the investments now that we wanna invest, we might borrow for smaller things than might seem normal so that we can get to a total balance of that 5%. Now, each of those individual decisions could be um, you know, looked at again and I, and, you know, certainly you could look at it and say, well, I don't understand why that particular one was, but it was likely based on the fact that as a total, we were trying to get to a 5% figure. So that, that, that would be the reason by and why a smaller thing is borrowed as opposed to a cash allocation. Yeah. All right. Thanks for me. I'm not, I'm not complaining at all more. I know you have good reason for it. So I just wanted to understand the reason. And for some reason, I just couldn't let it go. So thank you very much for your time and explanation. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent report. No questions or comments. Okay, thank you. And, and I just have a, one, a, a brief comment, but I just want to, Mr. Hurd seconded a motion. I didn't hear Mrs. Mahan make the motion. So if I could just reconfirm with her that there is a motion to receive the, uh, the report. Yes. Okay, thank great. You. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, thank you for the report. I, I do just a comment and Mr. Diggins touched on it briefly on the high rate of collections for the uh, building permits. And hopefully that's something we see, probably well, we won't see it in fiscal 22, but maybe that bodes well for new growth for our property taxes in fiscal 23, given the high rate of um, permits being being pulled this year. And, and um, also thank you 
for separating out the marijuana tax line item. We've talked about that before, and now we can uh, you know, see that along with the Airbnb tax, which is um, separately stated. So thank you, Ms. Cody, for the report. Thank you, Mr. Pooler, as well. And um, with that, we have a motion to um, receive the report from Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Unanimous vote. Great, thank you. Okay, we will move on to item three uh, for approval, acceptance of grants from the Lawrence and Lillian Solomon Foundation. Daniel Amstutz, Senior Transportation Planner. Uh, Mr. Chapdelaine. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I, I told Mr. Amstutz that I, th I think I could handle this one without his uh, attendance tonight if, the, if you would accept that. So this is asking the board to vote acceptance of a grant from the Solomon Foundation to help support uh, a grant we received from the state to initiate a study of ways to connect uh, our Minuteman bikeway to the Mystic Valley uh, Parkway, the Mystic Valley uh, pathway. Uh, it would be an exciting connection for pedestrians and bicyclists connecting uh, you know, the already very well used asset of the Minuteman bikeway um, and to, to sort of a, a budding asset of the Mystic Valley pathway. So we uh, were excited to be able to get this grant. The state grant was an $80,000 uh, grant, which we received via the efforts of the Planning and Community Development Department applying for it. And this grant from the Solomon Foundation would provide $10,000 for a total of $90,000 uh, to begin this uh, study effort to see how the corridor could be improved. So I would, I would request your favorable action on receiving the grant. Okay, great, thank you, Mr. Chapter. And before I turn it to the board, now we had told Mr. Amstutz we put him at the beginning of a meeting. So I think I'm gonna to have to wait until he actually shows up next time and uh, we'll do that again for him. So uh, <laughs> he'll still get credit for that. Um, okay, um, with that, I will turn to Mr. Diggins. Um. Mr. Chair, I, I, I am happy to approve um, the request you know, or, or the acceptance of, of, of this um, of grant. You know, and I think this is a, a great cause. You know, uh, and, and I love the fact that we will be working with you know, some other municipalities in the region. It'll be really interesting to see what happens, what they come up with those, for those, um, those, those intersections, those big intersections. And so, so this is exciting. Great. Thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, Mr. Helmut. Thank you. I'm very happy to second this and to support this. Um, yeah, the the connect the interconnectedness of our recreational assets is is a really worthy goal. Um, and the town manager and I were just talking about that earlier today on, an, on another area, and I think that that's a it's a real win win for for the residents of the towns, but the municipalities have a chance to collaborate and, and kind of share. Um, and get more than the sum of its parts when you connect to uh, to great re recreational assets. So uh, it's, a, it's a nice thing, and I appreciate the uh, the work on the part of the staff to get the grant and, and have the vision to to uh, pursue this. Great. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, I'm very happy to support this. Thank you to the town manager for presenting it. Um, God bless Daniel Amstutz. <laughs> We got to him early, but we'll get him early next time. And you just want to say thank you to the um, Greener Greater Boston and Byron Solomon Foundations um, for helping us to obtain this initial eighty thousand uh, dollar designation for a feasibility study. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Always happy to approve accepting money on behalf of the town. So happy to support this. And this is something that I know has been really in people, when, especially in the campaign trail last spring, there was a lot of residents who were talking about connecting our bikeways. So uh, I'm excited to see what we can come up with. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Yeah, I'm yeah, really excited about this project as well. And, and I think the fact that it's going to ultimately down the road look at both rotaries in Arlington and in Medford for connections is is, is a is a big thing because there's a lot of recreation and and walking and bike path space on the other side of the river as well and so I'm um, happy to support this so on a motion by Mr. Diggins seconded by Mr. Helmuth for acceptance of the grant from the uh, Lawrence and Lillian Solomon Foundation Attorney Heim Mr. Hurd yes Mr. Diggins 
Yes. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Great. Thank you, Attorney Hyde. Um, item four is a presentation and vote, Veteran Memorial Park designation, Jeffrey A. Chunglo, Director of Veteran Services. Good evening, Mr. Chunglo. Hi, how is everyone? Good, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to thank you for your time. Um, I did forward a letter to the board on October 26, uh, 2001, in support of the designation of a Veterans Memorial Park. So I just wanted to uh, give everyone a little background for those that may be tuning in. Um, so prior to the pandemic, our Veterans Council be began holding open meetings and we held a number of those, uh, probably five or six uh, prior to the pandemic. And we were discussing uh, possible alternative locations for Veterans Memorial Park. But at the end of those meetings, the overwhelming uh, feedback from both veterans and non-veterans was uh, not to relocate from the center of town and focus on improving that particular area. So the first step to kind of go along with that was trying to find out who has ownership of that parcel of land. Uh, so Jim Feeney did some research and he found that uh, it goes back to 1921 where the town uh, purchased that property through eminent domain. And um, that property was to be designated as a town park. So with that in mind, our goal is not to change that at all. And we want to uh, officially have the Board of Selectmen designate that parcel of land from uh, the fire station up to the Civil War Memorial uh, to designate that as Arlington's official Veterans Memorial Park. Thank you, Mr. Chunglo. I will turn it to the board now for questions and, and, and or comments. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Hurd. Happy to support this. Thank you for your work on this, Jeff. Um, I, I think I've always called this Veterans Park, so I, happy to give that you know official designation. And I'm glad to to hear that you know, the memorials will stay where they are, front and center. I think that's the, the appropriate location for them. So again, I mean, this this area of Arlington is near and dear to my heart. I've said this in many events, but my grandmother used to place the wreath there. So we've all, we've we've uh, attended many events there, and you know, I, I think it's sacred ground. And happy to uh, to be able to vote on this. So thank you for the presentation, and thank you for all the work that you do. Thank thank you, Mr. Hurd, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, was that a motion for Mr. Hurd? Move approval. All right, and I'll second it. And, uh, and um, um, just a, um, a couple of questions. Uh, what is the Article 97 protections that are referenced in the letter? So, um, and maybe yes. Mr. Chaplain can help me out on that one, on the specifics. So that, that um, in an, in brief, that is a statutory protection for lands designated as parks or open space and changing their use away from park or open space would require a series of actions, I believe, by town meeting and then eventually even the state legislature. So it's, it's a pretty hardy protection for what's designated as Article 97 land. Um, so I think as Jeff lays out in his letter, we're not changing this from a park, so that shouldn't be triggered. But um, if you want, if you wanted to not have it be a park anymore, there would be a challenge out of this. I see. So that's Article ninety seven of our bylaws. No, just so it's actually of the state constitution, Mr. Diggins. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's what that's because I was I was trying to find it, and, and so so all right, that's 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 more curious question. Um, and the other others like what other um what other sites were considered. Um, so we had uh, looked at Cook's Hollow. Um, we were also looking at uh, Robbins Farm Park. Um, 
And, um, oh, geez, you caught me off guard here. That's okay. That's um, no, I was just kind of curious. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't participate in any of the meetings. And so, I mean, so, I so the, the big concern from, from feedback from residents and veterans was that um, the, the alternate locations were kind of off the beaten path um, and not readily accessible. So, so that was the big concern. And, you know, like most veterans, uh, they, they're proud of their service. They, they would like to have that front and center in the town, especially since the Civil War Memorial is there. Um, so, so that's what we're looking to do. And, and I'm, as I'm sure you're aware, that current location is in disrepair and it really needs to be improved. Um, and, and to really pay tribute to the veterans of Arlington, long uh, history of service in the community. And I'd just like to pay tribute to them. And also just to let you know, I, I believe there are uh, veteran council members that are on the uh, Zoom tonight. So, uh, so they are uh, here and they're supportive of the uh, initiative as well. And, and I'm also sure that the Chamber of Commerce would like to see me that area also made me uh, more, more, um, more presentable for everybody. So great, great work. Thank you. Happy to support sure. it. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. I'm Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chunglo. And, and I'm glad that you mentioned that the veteran council's uh, members are attending. I want to thank them for their service to the country uh, and for the service to the town uh, on the council. And, and uh, I remember back when I was chair of the CPA committee and we contemplated uh, the Cook's Hollow idea. And I remember at the time, I think that we, we weren't able to fund it for other, other reasons, uh, not having to do with the merits. But, you know, we, I remember you saying that you were going to really work with the veterans community and, and really reach out and ask them what, what, where they wanted the memorial. And um, I'm just so pleased that you did that legwork, no surprise at all, of course. Um, and that you know, this represents um, really authentic engagement with our veterans and, and that their voices is heard. And, uh, and I am very happy to support this and support what, what they would like to do. And I hope that we can um, find the funds to, to get the memorial fixed up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I also wanna thank our director our veteran services in, in the committee um, for looking into this and continuing on. I certainly agree with the motion um, in terms of designating the area at headquarters fire station as the veterans memorial park. Um, I just have two things. One is just to, since we have the committee here on the call, as well as our um, director of veteran services, I do know um, when we gather for Veterans Days, Veterans Day and other similar events, um, I would just put a request in that I assume you all have been already entertaining that um, when this particular piece of land is redesigned, that it's a little more handicap accessible so that our veterans and our Arlington residents who are disabled or not able body um, aren't sort of, and I'm not saying this is a negative, but aren't sort of relegated to attend those events and, and they have to stay in the parking lot um, of that, that area of business. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, since we do have Mr. Chunglo here, um, Navy man, um, if you could just perhaps remind us and everyone who has zoomed in on the call and who's watching from ACMI of what our Veterans Day celebrations are. Sure. Um, so first of all, um, any, any designs for the park, obviously everything is gonna be ADA compliant. Um, and the intent is to make it a reflective area that is proud, you know, where, where not only veterans, but uh, non-veteran residents can go and enjoy the park. And, and kind of engage in that history. So, um, so that is the, I just wanted to address that concern you had. Um, and then for Veterans Day this year, um, it's, we're gonna be meeting in public again, um, and it's been two years. 
So I'm really looking forward to that. So this coming Thursday is Veterans Day. We'll proceed uh, from Walgreens. We'll have our, our brief parade up to the Central Fire Station. The ceremony itself will be conducted in the fire station. And uh, I will throw out that, you know, since we are gonna be gathering inside, that uh, people who attend will be required to wear masks. Uh, but we will be able to gather in person. Um, I have a, a exciting program planned. I, I think uh, residents are gonna enjoy it. And it's nice to be back in the public view. And if you could just remind us what time we're kicking off marching sure, from yeah, Walgreens so the, and fire station. The parade, the parade will start at 1030 in the morning. Uh, so probably a 15 minute walk up to the central fire station. And, you know, between quarter of uh, and 11, we'll start the ceremony and uh, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm all set. Great. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Thank, thank you for asking about the, the, the ceremony this Thursday. Um, Mr. Chunglo, I want to thank you um, before we start or before I start my comments for your service to the country and also thank the members of the Veterans Council who are on the call tonight for their service as well. Um, I'm happy to support this and I, I appreciate the memo that you sent. I did go back and take a look at the, the, the a few things from 1922 and I think this is the perfect location to expand the Veterans Memorial Park. The Civil War Memorial was dedicated in 1887 before this parkland was even acquired in 1922. So it's, it seems perfectly appropriate to keep everything at that site. And, and um, interestingly enough, this park was acquired by eminent domain at the same time that the fire station land was acquired by eminent domain. And it was a uh, fire station vote wasn't as close as, as this vote was for uh, creating the Memorial Park. But I think as you look at it and, and you know, we, we are at the site and sometimes as we go by it, that certainly is in need of uh, upgrades. And I know you want to update the honor roll for the, the members of our community who served in the war on terror, for example, and, and um, um, also improve other areas. So I'm, I'm happy to support this. I wanna thank you for bringing this forward to us. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Absolutely. Yeah, no, looking forward to that. Thank you. Um, right. So for, we have a motion to approve the um, designation of this parcel as the Arlington's Veteran Memorial Park. Uh, motion was made by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Great. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, item five tonight is the PJ Library Hanukkah Lan Lantern Walk. Stephanie Marlin Curiel, Commission for Arts and Culture. Mr. Chairman, I don't see. Stephanie, no, I don't see Stephanie logged into the meeting. I'm not sure if there's somebody else here for this agenda item. If there is, if they could raise their hand. I'm not, I'm not seeing anybody. Um, I, okay. I, don't, I don't know if Stephanie knew that, that she needed, whether or not she needed to be here. Okay, I'm just looking at the request. I think the request is for December 4th. Um, and again, I, I haven't been contacted directly about this. I don't know if any members have. Um, we had this issue previously on uh, an item where our preference is to have a proponent for an application appear before us. Um, Last time we had a situation where the date of the event was going to take place before our next meeting. I, I guess I turn to, to board members if anybody is aware um, or has had any discussions on this and would like to move it forward, that's fine. Otherwise, uh, perhaps a motion to table until our next meeting before this event. I, and I leave it to board members if anybody has had those discussions. And I don't see anybody who has. Um, Mr. Sable. Okay. We have a motion to table by Mrs. Mon. And again, I note that 
the event is scheduled for December 4th. We are going to have a meeting on November 22nd. I'll second it. Okay. Thank you. Anybody have any other comment? Okay. So we have a motion to table. We'll table it until November 22nd. Motion made by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Uh, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Unanimous vote. Okay, thank you. Okay, next is the consent agenda. We have four items this evening. Uh, item six, minutes of meeting meetings, October 13th, 2021, October 25th, 2021, October 28th, 2021. Item seven, reappointments to the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont and Kevin Mills, terms to expire 10-31-2024. Item eight is a request for free parking for local holiday shopping. Beth Locke, Executive Director of the Arlington Chamber of Commerce. Item nine for approval, Sharp Arlington First Banners. Beth Locke, Executive Director, Arlington Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, I would like to move approval and uh, ask the chairman if Ms. Locke is here, if. Um, if she is here, she could speak to her two agenda items. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, I believe Ms. Locke is here. She is, she is, Mr. Chair, if you would. Yep, I can promote her. Sure. Like. Good evening, Ms. Locke. Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? I have yes, to we can. Yeah, yeah. How are you tonight? Okay, good, good. Um, I think these are fairly uh, standard uh, annual requests, specifically the parking. Um, and the banners will be the same banners that we put up last year around this time. Uh, but if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Mahan, did you have any, I don't know if you had any questions or comments? Um, it, no, the, the only comment I would have is I, I really want to thank Ms. Locke for all the energy and enthusiasm um, that she's dedicated, um, not just to the Chamber of Commerce and, and our businesses, but to the town of Arlington, because you're, you're definitely doing a lot of stuff and um, <laughs> you have the experience and expertise and we're very fortunate to have you. And um, I certainly look forward to working with you, um, as do my colleagues uh, and the town manager as well as um, the two uh, requests that we received from Ms. Locke regarding um, two really exciting opportunities that either could be funded through opera funding, <clears throat> excuse me, or through state funding. So we're definitely on top of that and appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Happy to second that. Um, and then Ms. Locke, if you can just run down briefly the Shop Arlington for First gift certificates, because I think that's something that's great, a good thing to spread the word out. In the holiday yeah, um, thank you for bringing that up. So that is a, um, a gift certificate slash check slash gift card program that we've run for many years, uh, sponsored by Leader Bank. Um, we have found at times a bit of confusion within the community about it. Various businesses um, are, are, anyway, the, po the point of the program obviously is to keep dollars within Arlington. Um, and so a lot of times folks will purchase gift certificates as gifts. It's a great teacher's gift, a great gift, uh, for a family member who may want to buy something at an Arlington business, but they don't, you know, you don't know exactly what they want. So um, they're awarded a gift check, but the the actual item, it's it's really effectively a gift card. Um, and I don't think I'm probably answering your question properly. It, it's an attempt to keep dollars within Arlington. Um, above and beyond that, I'll say, I, I actually just had a conversation today at Whole Foods where they, um, I found that they were, had been re uh, accepting the gift cards 
certificates. Now they're not, then now they're going to be again. So it's something we're working on um, all the time, but it's a, um, it's a, it's an, a strong attempt to keep the dollars within Arlington. Yeah, thank you. It is a great program just for people that are local that are, you know, a gift card is generally what you get somebody these days, but instead of picking one specific location, I think there's exactly like a hundred. That's exactly what it is. Right. And the only reason it's not an actual right. card is because uh, businesses use different point of purchase systems. So it's a gift check. It looks like a check, yep. but it's actually a gift card. Yeah. So thank we'll you. Get, get some shop on LinkedIn first. Yeah. Go gift. for it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I will support this, but also um, to give me incentive to have a conversation with you, Ms. Locke, and the Chamber of Commerce, because I, rec I represent you all on tap. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to get some sense as to whether this actually increases business, you know, because I can see tension on this. I mean, if you allow people to free park, I mean, they stay there forever, I mean, and so the parking spaces get locked up. I mean, and, and so um, I just want to understand that, I mean, and, and then some other issues around parking. So so um, we'll have some conversations before we do this again next year. But um, Yeah, I will make, can I make a quick comment on that? Sure. Yeah. This request is only for weekends, yeah. Saturdays and Sundays. So um, I think issues around parking tend to be more that uh, someone might park and you know get on the bus and go into boston and be gone all day which would not be the case on a saturday or a sunday i don't think it's taking up parking that um would otherwise be used by other folks i mean re especially right now um but it's it's sort of a goodwill type of um request more than anything else and goodwill is is the best i mean um Best reserve you can build. I mean, mm -hmm. so, so, but like I said, I mean, I mean um, I, I'm not, I'm not criticizing. Uh, I'm really using it as an incentive to to meet with you all and have discussions about this yeah, and, and sure. parking in general. I mean, so, yeah. so, mm -hmm. so, thank you for that response. Though, I mean, it's a good response. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Hurd, did you want to add something to that, or? Yeah, I just want to mention. That I think. You know, it's just Saturdays that this would apply, but I think the park enforcement officers can still enforce limitations on parking. The par that's cars can't be parked there for eight hours. They still do their loops. It's just the meters aren't on. Right, within reason, of course. Great. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I am also glad to support this. And, you know, I think this year, especially given the really rough year and a half, two years that our local businesses have had due to COVID. I am very happy to sacrifice a little bit of parking revenue uh, to give them a boost this, this weekend, uh, these weekends. So, so thanks for that. And thanks for all your other work. Um, and since it's a consent agenda on one vote, I want to also thank Mr. DuPont and Mr. Mills for their service on the Zoning Board of Appeals. The ZBA is a lot of work, it is often unsung and it is really important. So I'm grateful that they are willing to be reappointed. Um, and um, usually the, the reward for hard work is more hard work and that's what they're getting, but I wanted to make sure they also got some gratitude as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Yeah, I'm also happy to support all the items. Thank you, Ms. Locke, for, for coming on uh, this evening. And as, as to the parking, I'm happy to, you know, if, if we get more consumers coming to Arlington, I can live with people parking and maybe going into the city as well. They'll help the local businesses, uh, hopefully uh, through this holiday season. And um, thank you, Mr. Helmuth for pointing out Mr. Mills and Mr. DuPont because this year, especially they have been meeting um, throughout the summer, throughout the year, they have a number of projects. They had two comprehensive permits before them this year. So uh, we thank them for their work as well. So on a motion on the consent agenda by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Helmer? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Diggins. That's okay, Mr. Mr. Hahn. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Thank you. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. Uh, item 10, we have two appointments to the Open Space Committee. 
Eliza Hatch and Brian McBride. Um, are either they're both Eliza here. or Brian with? Okay, they're both here. Would you like me to bring them both up, Mr. Sure. Yeah. Good evening, Ms. Hatch. I can see you now. I think Mr. McBride is just about to join us. Um, and before we start, okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Hatch. I, I'm happy to, to hear that your, um, I believe it's your daughter is, is doing well. Um, so that you saw that in your application. Happy to, yes. Thank to, you. Uh, to, to hear that. And um, why don't we do this? Why don't we start with you, Ms. Hatch, and then we'll go to Mr. McBride. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're why you're interested in serving on the Open Space Committee. Sure. Um, so I moved to Arlington in 2019, uh, and I've been sort of trying to figure out how to engage with the town in a way that can use my skills and that I find you know interesting and engaging as well. Um, and I have explored a few avenues. Um, I was able to talk to Anne about uh, the, the chairwoman of the committee um, and she was very encouraging. I am very interested in open space work in general. Um, my profession thus far has been in travel and I'm applying to law school currently, so sort of different, um, but my family history is in open space and conservation. Um, and so it sort of runs in my blood. Uh, and I just love being outdoors. So it seemed like a really great fit. Uh, I joined a few committee meetings. Um, I know Brian did as well, and I found them really engaging, and the committee is um, just extremely well put together and uh, very well organized. So I'm excited to join them officially. Thank you, Ms. Hatch. And Mr. McBride, if you could do the same thing, tell us a little about yourself and uh, why you're interested in serving. Yes, yeah, sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Super. Right. So I've uh, I've had the good fortune uh, of living across from Robin's farm for 20 years now and uh, regular visitor of Monotomy and the, and the res uh, during my child, my child's uh, growing up here. Uh, so I just feel very grateful to the town for their open space, for their, for their parks and fields. And I love an opportunity to give something back. Um, I, I've seen during the COVID times how important open space is for community connections, for physical health, for mental health, for the global warming. There's just so many good things about it. It's really a, a no-brainer for me. I spent a lot of time leading hiking groups and doing other outdoor activities. And I'd love to be able to contribute in some way to the town when, where I benefited so much from it. Great. Thank, thank you, Mr. McBride. Um, I'll now turn to the board uh, and I will start with Mr. Hurd. Thank you both for your willingness to serve. We say this all the time, but we're always so impressed with the caliber of volunteers that we have in Arlington. It's really, really an amazing thing. And uh, just willing to step up and serve on any committee, not the least of which this the Open Space Committee, which is really important to a lot of town residents, uh, is really an amazing thing. So I'll, I'm happy to move approval of both appointments. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. I'll second that, I think, as part of the consent agenda uh, and um, to the... Um, Excuse me, no, this is a separate, this is separate, uh, it, it's a standalone. Oh, a standalone, sorry, sorry, I lost track. So, okay, then, then I'll have more reason to second it. Uh, and and, um, and um, so, Ms. Hatch, um, uh, you, you did a HIV AIDS seminar, freshman seminar. I'm impressed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Thank you. Uh, and that's, that's, that's um yeah that's that's pretty impressive. And the second uh question, the second thing I have to say is a question, and that is um, given how many times you've been to Tanzania, you think um you can maybe find this a sister city there? We have a sister city in Japan, and so I I absolutely can. I actually helped build a health clinic there. I wouldn't call it a city. Um, it's more of a very small village, but yes. Well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, that 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 counts. I mean, that that's, that would be you know, it's just all about connecting us mean to other places mean and, and so we maybe learn some more about uh the possibilities there uh and um to mr mcbride you know um uh, you know, um i see that you work at thermo fisher and and what i'll say about thermo fisher is having um recently had to um, look at some safety data sheets from various companies 
they have the best ones. I mean, you know, okay. like companies, safety data sheets, that's the one, you know, and, and given your experience in biotech, I, mean, I have a, a, a soft request, you know, and that is, and, and I'll touch base with you maybe later if you want, um, that is to get a sense from you as to whether you think, you know, um, Arlington could maybe attract some more biotech. You know, we're, we're looking for more. All right, yeah. right. Yeah, There's a facility uh, down on Mill Street today, I believe. Yeah, it's a great location. Yeah, yeah. And, and if if so, how we could go about doing that. So just a, a soft request, maybe um, have a conversation sometime. Thank you. Love it. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helman. Thank you both for being willing to serve. It is a great committee. Ms. LaRoyer and her colleagues do outstanding work. I've been privileged to work with them just a little bit back when I was uh, chair of the CPA committee. And uh, they're in progress with the new open space plan, so as you know, and uh, that'll be good to have the extra help. Um, Ms. Hatch, I love that you have conservation and open space in your blood and your family history. That's the first time I've heard someone say that. And I think that's a wonderful legacy to be proud of. Uh, Mr. McBride, we're neighbors. I also live near uh, Robbins Farm and I couldn't agree more with your vision for the place of open space and our community and in the world for all the reasons that you that you gave and um, just so thrilled that you're willing to, uh, to serve. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. More than excited to um, support the motion, um, as well as uh, just sort of advocating with um, Ms. Has Hatch and Mr. McBride to definitely take advantage of CPA Community Preservation Act funds, which um, our current board member, Mr. Helbeth, uh, was previously the co-chair of that committee, so he's the best resource. I like to say I'm, I'm well-versed in everything, but I would steer you towards him, as well as there are an awful lot of opportunities um, pre-COVID and current COVID um, for state funding um, around open space. And uh, the other thing I would say to both of you is um, one statement, second a question of each of you. The first statement is uh, as we look at Arlington's current open spaces and other spaces that we can retain in that category to kind of look at a, a multi-use um, open space area, sort of, you know, not just think one thing open space for just purely open space. And since you both have been attending um, the open space committee meetings, is there anything, um, I guess I'll start with Ms. Hatch um, going al alphabetically and then Ms. McBride, Anything that you all have seen at uh, the meetings that either A, you're really interested in and kind of want to build upon or B, something that you feel like you can bring, bring to the committee as a unique opportunity, whether it, cannot be, whether it can and cannot be followed through on. Um, so, or C, anything else you want to say from attending those meetings? So if I could ask Ms. Hatch first and then Mr. McBride. Um, I was particularly excited to learn about the rain gardens, which I know I had encountered through Emily at Conservation Commission when we had a project go there, um, but to learn a little bit more about them and, you know, even small open spaces that can make such a difference in our landscape um, and in our daily lives, I think are really remarkable and interesting. Uh, and I'm really excited to learn more about them. And hopefully we can get some more interesting small areas around town to sort of beautify everything and make it feel a little bit more outdoorsy. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I guess my comments would be, I, I think there are a lot of um, under, underdeveloped, under enhanced open spaces in town. I've always been a particular fan of the Mill Brook. I think they call it the lin linear park idea, Cook's Hollow. Uh, when I was leading a kids hiking group some years back, we followed the water from the res uh, to the mystic. Um, it was just a fantastic experience. I think everyone in our league should, should try it once. I think there's a lot to be done along those lines of enhancing those existing resources and, and, and awareness as well, not just, not uh, building them up, but letting people know what's available. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McBride and Ms. Hatch. Thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And um, yeah, I also want to echo the comments of my colleagues, thanking both of you for your willingness to serve on the Open Space Committee. This is an important period coming up 
because our current open space plan is going to expire in 2022 and, and uh, you'll both be working on a new plan, which is which is critical. Um, Ms. Hatch, I just wanna say briefly, I noticed uh, in your background there, you were a government and psychology major at Skidmore. My son is a political science and psychology major at Skidmore right now, so. Um, ah, wonderful. Uh, so, tell, him, know, tell him to take Ron Sibes classes. Okay, I will. And, um, and, and Mr. McBride, I also, in your cover letter, you mentioned uh, Monotomy Rocks Park, and it's really a gem of a resource for the uh, community and, and a, a place where I try to go to before every meeting, just to clear my head yeah. before three or four hours of select board meetings. I was there a little bit in the dark tonight walking around, but it's a, what a great resource. So thank you both for your willingness and, and also want to applaud both of you for going to the meetings. And we've seen this a lot lately with different committees people attending the meetings, becoming interested and then getting involved. And, and so that's, uh, we really appreciate that. Um, Mr. Helmuth, you put your hand up. Did you want to add something or? Oh, you just need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I clicked the wrong button. Uh, thank you, just just briefly. Um, and you mentioned, Mr. Chair, the the, uh, the open space plan and Mr. McBride mentioned uh, the, the linear park. And I just wanted to add my encouragement uh, that as you do this, that that concept for the linear park along Mill Brook has been around for a long time and has been the dream of some really good conservationists um, for decades. And I would be thrilled if that could come to fruition. We did some CPA funding in Wellington Park to, to kind of create a little piece of that um, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. So you can look into that and I'd be happy to talk with you about that or Ms. Leroy knows all about it. Um, but I think that when you think about a plan, I know it's a short-term operational plan for funding, but if there's a place for vision, um, I would love not to lose sight of that, of that um, asset and that opportunity. So just a little That's plug. Really great to hear. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, okay, so on a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins uh, for approval of Ms. Hatch and Mr. McBride uh, for appointments to the Open Space Committee, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Yeah, thank you both. Thanks so much. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Um, okay. Yeah. Item 11 is light under licenses and permits for approval, common victuals license. Boone Noon Market, 161 Mass Ave. And do we have the applicants with us tonight? Yes, I just promoted them. Good evening. Yeah. Hi, if you could uh, first identify yourselves and also just tell us a little bit about the application for the um, location at 161 Mass Ave. Right, so uh, that place was the Thailand Cafe before and when um, the previous owner called- Excuse me, before you start, could you just give us your names just for the record? Okay, okay. sorry about that. My, so, sure. You first. My name is Natashai Chaojuran Wong. You guys can call me Jeep, like a car, this is my nickname. And my name is Pachara Win Watanakitipat. You can call me Pachara. Sure. Would be easier. Yep, so um, we are taking over that space because the uh, Andy was too tired to, to work with, by himself alone. Like uh, he do everything himself for many years and we just been searching around for for the space for um for a restaurant a thai restaurant to open one in arlington we moved to arlington on may and we really love living in here arlington compared to previous places that we've been living and yeah we we came across with the andy the thailand cafe and yeah, he said, just like, why don't just take his space and then we're gonna do like the, the same, like the Thai food, like he did before. And yeah, we hope to be some good addition to Arlington. 
and you know some good Thai food here. We 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 haven't seen a lot of the Thai food um, in Arlington yet. Okay, um, thank you. I will turn it to the board for questions or comments, um, and I'll start with Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, um, I will move approval, and 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 um, and I'll just say first off, flattery will get you everywhere. It uh, it's also uh, in that paragraph, like is Arlington is the best place we've ever lived in the U.S. I mean, uh, and and also it seems like you know. Your nomination by Bon Appetit, you know, it says a lot about about you. We do have some good Thai food here, uh, uh, but there's only one Thai food place in the East, you know, and you will be replacing it. I live in the East, and so I'm looking forward to uh, frequenting your place a lot because uh, I really like the menu. And I have to say that um, the, the Heights is coming along in terms of good places to eat, so we kind of need to keep you know, we need to keep up, and so you're going to help us with that. And so we're really looking forward to having uh, uh, your restaurant here, and I'm really happy that you're enjoying living in Arlington, and it's our job to make that continue to be the case. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I'd like to second that motion for approval and to thank you for choosing Arlington for your home and for your business. We are very excited to see what you are able to do to, for the community. And even though I live in the Heights, I, I think I could manage to, to travel to the east, to the other side of the tracks, and, uh, and check out this exciting new, new Thai food when it's ready. Thank you. Yeah. Th thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to say from uh, reading the other information that uh, both of you have provided, and I'm probably going to butcher your name, and I, I apologize, but um, Pacha Dewin and um, Nutha Chai. Yep, yep. Um, uh, I, re I really was excited by what you wrote in your sort of other explanation. I'm excited about your Asian Thai food, and um, I was really impressed that um, you, you've been recognized, um, Nutha Chai, in, in uh, I think it was uh, by Pacha. Bon Appetit. Is, is, could, could one of you speak to that? Because I'm so impressed by that because I can read the words and understand what the words say, but I don't really grasp what that really is. So if you could just speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so that was the, the prize that um, I have brought the restaurant called Daxen in Somerville. Yeah, um, to the one of the top uh, 50 best restaurant in the United States. And that's um, nominated by the online magazine called Bon Appetit. Yep. And yeah, I'm working on marketing and develop the recipe with my friends, but it's turned out not um, a good place to us. So we decided to quit and then we come here to open our own. No, and, and that's really exciting. And um, my family's also involved in the restaurant business, which is one of the most difficult businesses ever. Um, putting aside the pandemic, that's another thing that you all have to deal with. Um, yeah. But I, I really get from what you both have submitted um, that you're really clear on not only your menu, but um, how you're going to execute those dishes. Because that's, as you know, I'm not telling you both anything you don't know. The really important thing is um, having a really good uh, menu offering um, and, and having a consistent chef preparation, as well as having uh, the ability, which you both obviously have, in, in getting that recognition um, from Dakin out of some of all with the Bon Appetit um, mention. Um, I'm really excited to see what you're going to do here in Arlington. So I look forward and, and, and thank you for coming to us. And I'm almost as excited as you all are just reading what you put in your application. Okay. So thank you both. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Thank you. And thank you both for choosing Arlington in the wake of COVID and all the strains it's had on the restaurant industry. It's, it's nice that we've seen in the past six months 
a number of new restaurants that have chosen Arlington to start a new business. And uh, we appreciate having faith in our community. And uh, I think that this will be a very successful restaurant. Uh, we love Thai food in our house, so we'll be down there. I'm excited to try some donut shrimp. That's not, <laughs> if anything, it, it's good marketing. So we'll, we'll be down there and I wish you the best of luck. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hurt. I was going to mention the donut shrimp as well, but I, um, if you were open, I'd put it in order for a basil eggplant and pad thai right now. But it uh, looks like you have a great menu. Um, thank you for the words that you put in the application, and we want to wish you the best of luck um, with the new business um, that they're on Mass Ave. So we have a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mohan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Jan misspoke. Best of luck. Thank, thank you. you very much. Sure. sure. Uh, okay, next is open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. Before I open open forum, I wanna let people know that we will be taking public comment on the discussion of the 21 precinct map. So if you have something other than the 21 precinct map to talk about, please um, signal by raising your hand for open forum now. And, and again, bear in mind that we will have public comment later uh, on the other item. So we have two hands raised, Mr. Chairman. The first name okay. is Paul Schlickman. Oh, oh okay. Uh, now, now, now five hands raised. Uh, first okay. name is still Paul Schlickman. Okay. And now I'm hungry. That was a great presentation. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Mr. Schlickman. Good evening. I'm Paul Schlickman, town meeting member, Precinct 9, and I reside at 47 Mystic Street. On November 3rd, the town tweeted photos of the newly painted lanes at Appleton Street and Massachusetts Avenue. This occurred 21 days after the plan was approved by the select board. Charlie Proctor was killed at this intersection on May 5th, 2020. Since then, the town has filled the intersection with traffic cones in the afternoon, instituted a left turn prohibition during the hours before sundown, and stationed a police detail to enforce the prohibition. On December 31st, 2019, 126 days before Charlie Proctor was killed, my downstairs neighbor, Andrew Rocher, was killed in the crosswalk on Chestnut Street while attempting to walk to 7 a.m. Mass at St. Agnes. On May 12th, 2021, 498 days after Andrew Rochus was killed, the Transportation Advisory Committee voted to forward its recommendation for traffic calming on Chestnut Street to the Select Board. On June 21st, 538 days after Andrew Rochus was killed, the select board approved these recommendations for traffic calming on Chestnut Street. On August 13th, 591 days after Andrew Rochus was killed and 53 days after the select board vote, a no turn on red sign was restored on Chestnut Street at Mystic Street. Today, 678 days after Andrew Rochus was killed and 140 days after the select board vote. Key elements of this plan are unfulfilled. The plan included restriping Chestnut Street to provide 11 foot travel lanes, seven foot parking lanes, five foot bicycle lanes and two foot buffer lanes. None of this has been done. The plan included a temporary island and curb extensions on Chestnut Street in 2021 in order to evaluate them in preparation for the 2022 construction season. This has not been done. The plan included installing advanced crosswalk signs and moving one of the existing crosswalk signs. 
This has not been done. The plan included the installation of pedestrian activated warning signals at the Chestnut Terrace crosswalk. This will need to occur in conjunction with the construction of permanent bump out which requires an analysis of the preliminary bump outs scheduled for the 2021, as well as the identification of $25,000 in funding. The official tweets of Appleton Street improvements serve to amplify the disappointment that this board and the town manager have not followed up on their commitments to pedestrian safety on Chestnut Street. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. The next speaker is Linda Verone. Apologies, I hit the, the wrong button. Good evening, Ms. Verone. Hello? Hello, yep, good evening. Yep, you're okay. on open forum. All right, um, I just got the unmute signal. Um, my name is Linda Verone. I live at 54 Medford Street, which is otherwise known as Chestnut Manor. And I am a frequent pedestrian crossing at the Chestnut Terrace pedestrian crosswalk. And I am similarly um, dismayed and disappointed at the um, lack of progress on creating a safe crosswalk for the many residents of Chestnut Manor. Um, the fact is that this is a dangerous crossing on a curved street which makes visibility of pedestrians particularly difficult, even with the idea of a curb bump out. And the key solution, which is a pedestrian activated flashing crossing sign, similar to the one on Mill Street, is in the proposed TAC um, plan to be implemented in five years. I think a number of the other things that are being suggested um, are almost like um, window dressing and the key safety proviso of the um, flashing crosswalk should be moved up to one of the first things that's done. Um, I, I don't know what to say other than I'm, I'm kind of amazed at at the lack of progress of this. One thing that was suggested at the April select board meeting that Sean Garbelli attended is he offered to find partial funding for the flashing pedestrian crosswalk. And I'm not seeing anything anywhere about looking into that to get that money to help. Um, from what I understand, the cost of that crosswalk would be $25,000, give or take, whereas some of the other improvements are significantly more expensive. I'm kind of confused as to, it seems like the plan is backwards. We need to have a safe crosswalk there. And just today, coming back from the library, the a little pedestrian crossing sign it's in the middle of the street, had been bumped six feet out of where it was supposed to be. So if people are bumping um, signs, then there's not a whole lot to prevent them from bumping and injuring or killing people. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Ferron. The next speaker is Marcy Beck.
Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Marcy Beck. I'm the daughter of Anne DeRosiers, the pedestrian who was struck and killed in the crosswalk at Chestnut Street. Um, I just wanted to speak and just say that I'm sad and disappointed that almost nothing has been done to improve the pedestrian safety measures at this crosswalk up to this point. TAC came up with a great plan. It was approved almost six months ago. Um, it's now been almost two years since my mother was killed. Um, safety improvements need to be implemented as soon as possible um, before another tragedy happens. Um, so I just wanted to speak and say, please, um, if we can get this moving, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beck. There's one more hand raised. Rieko Tanaka. Uh, good good evening, Ms. Tanaka. Yes, good evening. Um, I'm Rieko Tanaka, uh, town meeting member, Precinct 9, living 47 Mystic Street. I also would like to address this lack of progress on Chestnut Terrace Crosswalk. Um, it was bad enough to lose a neighbor, and it's always been difficult to use that crosswalk. And since last May, um, I joined the gym in, uh, on Mass Avenue Arlington Center. And I go there in the early morning. So very often it's before sunrise. And I now realize how difficult it is, even with very uh, quiet traffic. And I ended up bu buying those reflective sash, which has, you know, laced with LED light. And I have to walk like a walking Christmas tree to feel safe and um, to cross that road because there are uh, people driving very very fast then when i finished my workout the gym come uh, um even broad daylight because during the commute rush hour people are ignoring blatantly ignoring that do not block the intersection sign and they were also stopping on the crosswalk and uh, someone like me i'm five foot zero and uh, you know the people take uh the towards the mystic street people do the two lanes in and i don't know if it's kosher it doesn't look kosher to me but they do this so there is a unofficial left lane right lane and uh, i'm a i'm a short person so the car on the right lane can't see me actually walking the crossway so i always have to stop in the middle of the road and check and i need to peek out from this oncoming car so that the right lane car can see me um and which is really ridiculous um it, it, during the day it doesn't feel safe in the dark it doesn't feel safe and i was at uh i was watching that uh, april tap meeting too and i got very excited um but nothing's happening except the no right turn sign and it's not really making it any safer for us so please please, please go ahead and take some measures. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tanaka. Mr. Chairman, there's, there's one more hand raised and another attendee has been messaging me uh, unable to raise their hand who would like to speak. So okay. the next, next person with their hand raised is Patricia Warden. Good evening, Mrs. Warden. Okay, you're okay. I'm there. Right. Actually, uh, it's uh, Mr. Warden, John Warden, uh, Jason Street, and uh, Patricia um, is my technical person because I'm totally inept on this stuff. Uh, <clears throat> I, I sympathize with the folks at, at Chestnut Manor and, and Mystic Street, and that that is a bad that is a bad uh, uh, crossing, and I. Uh, I have gone through it, I hope, carefully and not hitting anybody in the crosswalk in the many years I've been traversing it. Uh, but the, the problem I, I would like to uh, mention, since 
traffic has come up as much as should be a much simpler one. Uh, a couple of years ago, they repaved uh, uh, Mill Street um, uh, uh, itself rather overdue, uh, but they never put the center line back. So uh, uh, cars are going just you know hoping uh, they they uh, stay to the right or to the left or wherever they're supposed to be, and there's multiple lanes there, and. Um, of course, I guess if the police stopped you, at least they couldn't get you for crossing marked lines. But um, I, I, seriously, I, I, I think it would be a simple matter for somebody from the DPW or whoever does to get out their paintbrush or whatever they do and just put that center line back in the middle of Mill Street. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. The last attendee asking to speak is Joanne Preston. Good evening, Ms. Preston. Good evening. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Joanne Preston, Mystic Lake Drive, town meeting member, Precinct 9. Uh, tonight, I'd like to urge the select board to ask the B DPW to move forward on the pedestrian safety plan for Chestnut Street. The, as was mentioned before, the select board had already voted to approve the TAC plan in June 2021, but almost nothing has been done. While holding a candidate sign on Chestnut Street in March 2020, I observed an informal memorial to Anne DeRosa, who, as you've learned, was killed in the crosswalk on her way to church three months earlier. It was constructed by a neighborhood in deep mourning. I also observed a woman in the middle of Chestnut Street trying to cross with cars whizzing by her in both directions. One car came very close to hitting her. She screamed out, stop, you killed my friend, Anne DeRosa. I promised this woman as a town meeting member for her precinct, I would work to make Chestnut Street safe in the near future. She replied cynically, Sure, and in what year would that be? After almost two years of writing proposals, talking to DPW, sending emails and attending meetings, I am now asking what she asked. In what year will pedestrian safety measures be instituted on Chestnut Street? Over 100 senior residents live in Chestnut Manor and must cross this dangerous street in order to attend their church, go shopping, visit parks. Some inexpensive changes recommended by TAC could be accomplished right now. Temporary bump outs to narrow the street, installing a temporary island, moving an existing crosswalk sign, demarcating bicycle lanes, and even repairing a crumbling section of the sidewalk. Instead, DPW has moved heavy equipment through Chestnut Street to Medford Street, where it's engaged in major sidewalk construction projects. Our Arlington Housing Authority residents and our residents of Webb Cowart neighborhood need to cross this dangerous street every day, and they ask you for their help. And the time has come to make these changes now before we lose any more of our senior citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Preston. I believe that, is that it, Mr. Chaplain? Okay, all right. Um, before I go to the next item, Mrs. Mahan, you had asked um, previously, if perhaps 9.30 might be a good time for a break. This actually might be a better time because the next item is gonna be somewhat lengthy. So if members would like a five minute break now, we can do that and then come back with item 12. I see people nodding their heads. So why don't we take a five minute break and we will go to the precinct discussion uh, at 9.10. Okay, I believe everybody is back. Uh, so I will go to the next item, item 12, presentation and discussion, 21 precinct map, re-precincting working group and uh, Julie Brazil, town clerk. Good evening, Ms. Brazil. Oh, 
just need you to unmute. Oh, there you are. Yep. yep. Hello. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So, so just briefly before you begin, and, and I, we and you can fill us in on the dates because the the legislative maps have been approved, and we talked about the deadline here in town mm -hmm. being thirty days after the the maps are approved um, at the state level. I, I believe that just occurred. So we have an outside date. Is it December fourth? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. And and I. See, Ms. Leinemer is on, and, and Ms. Harvey as well. Uh, and, Mr. and Mr. Gorowski. Oh, Mr. Gorowski, too. Okay, good. Yeah, nice to see you, Mr. Gorowski. Yeah. The hero of town meeting last year when he had the power outage, so nice yep. to see you again. <laughs> All right, so yes, the, um, the quick update on the timing is the governor signed the district maps, um, and so on uh, November 4th, so our deadline is Saturday, um, the 12th of December, uh, the 4th of December. I'm skeptical um, that Saturday is a good day to submit things. So I definitely want to get them in um, a couple days earlier than that. So uh, um, my suggestion is that we uh, get a sort of a firm commitment from the board to make a vote to select a final map at the next meeting on the 22nd, I'll submit that map to the, uh, to the state. They will prepare final documents, which will include um, text descriptions and all the paperwork that they need. Um, the reprecincting working group uh, and I will work very hard to make sure that that's all been double and triple checked. And then the board will need to probably schedule a brief special meeting um, well, yeah, November 29th, November 30th, in order to take a final vote on the package. The state has kind of specific language. We'll need to collect all five signatures. Um, and then that entire package, the signed certified vote and the approved materials <clears throat> go back into the state. So that's where we are. That's the process to get us to the finish line. Great. And did you want to present what you had mm -hmm. sent to us? Okay, just on the, yep. the option. Okay, perfect. Yep, absolutely. So let me fire this up. All right. Can everyone see? Okay. <clears throat> so I, I'm going to present two maps tonight. Um, just as a brief reminder, um, reprecincting is the process. Uh, it happens every 10 years. Communities must review precinct maps following the federal census. We rebalance population numbers so that all precincts are about the same size. And we look at communities of interest and local concerns, uh, like bylaw and zoning votes at town meeting, in order to draw precinct lines that allow residents to elect representatives to town meeting that fairly represent housing type, neighborhood density, and household income, since those would have a big impact on the debates and discussions at town meeting. We prepared, we prepared one map that makes the fewest possible changes and a second map that uses data uh, like housing type and income to reimagine some precincts so they make more sense as a coherent whole. Uh, in the second map, which the working group recommends, we were able to use major streets, uh, school district boundaries in several places that we think provide a natural structure to the changes. Both maps respect the house district line so we don't have split precincts. <clears throat> the summary chart identifies in red the five precincts that are out of numerical compliance in terms of population and have to be adjusted. Once you start moving the lines, there's sort of a trickle effect um, and <clears throat> some number of additional precincts have to be changed. Uh, there's a difference of only one precinct, precinct 13 um, affected. So we, we have to change 10 in the limited change map and we change 11 <clears throat> in the recommended map. Before I get, dig into uh, you know, the detailed uh, close-ups of the maps, I wanna remind everyone of just a couple things. Change is hard. Uh, evenly spacing polling locations around town is hard. 
uh, someone is always uh, going to be feel like they're an awkwardly distant from a polling location. Someone is always at the edge of a precinct. Um, and so while <clears throat> the maps that we look at might make, uh, might propose a change that's slightly worse in terms of the current polling locations, um, it's, that's probably not the biggest focus of the conversation simply because we always have the option um, of adjusting the polling locations um, over the next 10 years as we seek to, um, to make it work um, as best we can for everyone. Um, I'd also like to just thank um, resident Don Seltzer very briefly. Our limited change map is very similar to his. Don and I corresponded briefly on Friday and he didn't have any concerns <clears throat> about our version of the limited change map. Um, he thought our precinct 17 um, worked pretty well and he had a, an idea to smooth out a boundary line um, after digging into a little more, we, we aren't recommending it, but mostly because um, we think it just pushes the population in one precinct slightly lower than is necessary. But we certainly want to acknowledge Don's work on this very complicated process. So um, again, this summary briefly for the limited change map is uh, five precincts have to change, uh, five more precincts then are, uh, have to change in order to make the whole thing work and we don't split any districts. Um, so I just wanna dig in, um, just walk through a couple specifics on each map. <clears throat> Precinct five needs to gain population. So we add precincts, um, these two blocks to the overall precinct five. Um, that gives us sort of a nice shape, uses a strong, uh, strong boundary line uh, with Medford Street. Um, that pushes us slightly over the precinct, the population numbers we're looking for. So the uh, block in area two is pulled out of precinct five and moved into precinct seven. Um, <clears throat> we could have chosen another block, but in terms of sort of shape, um, <clears throat> this one made as much sense as uh, uh, this one you know, sort of made the most sense. Um, Moving a little more into the center of town, the um, sort of the heart of this series of changes is, is uh, here on the blocks surrounding Arlington High School. Um, we pull them out of precinct 17 and into precinct nine. We uh, pull, because precinct 17 definitely needed to lose population. Um, but that was a lot of population. So we add area one, which are, three blocks um, that come out of 15 and get added into 17. And that balances uh, Precinct 17's population uh, with the rest of the map. Uh, this strip along Summer Street comes out of 17 and moves into uh, Precinct 11 and Precinct 9 uh, in order to balance the populations. This, uh, this uses the bike path as a boundary line, which just has a nice, um, and has a nice benefit of allowing residents on both sides of Summer Street to be in the same precinct. Um, usually the, the center line is right down the middle of the street. And, um, and so this is sort of a, a little bit of a benefit um, in this section of the map. In order to balance the precinct population in nine um, uh, and, and 11, we have to swap this one little corner um, and uh, uh, which sort of shows you um, how fine grained uh, working with these census blocks can be um, in order to find you know, sort of the least disruptive, um, the least disruptive series of changes that make the whole, the whole concept work. Uh, <clears throat> and then finally, in this map, uh, we need to pull uh, three small blocks from precinct 10 into precinct eight which definitely needed to gain population. And the last change is, uh, is a very simple, we pull one block from uh, 18 into 16 in order to uh, add the population that's necessary to balance precinct 16. Um, and that's uh, a, you know, a very low impact change because everybody votes at the Dallin. Um, 
so, and you know, again, in summary, 10 precincts were changed. Um, we, uh, we successfully managed to avoid um, the need to split the precincts, um, which is uh, very helpful. We change a total of um, 10 precincts and 11 census blocks actually change their polling location. Um, uh, although only uh, really, I think only four of those blocks uh, would consider it sort of to be a, you know, a, a real negative change, a, 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 a greater distance to travel. And again, I'm hoping that we can adjust some of those by looking at the precinct, uh, at the polling locations over time. The, uh, the limited change model still maintains um, some of the existing precincts that we haven't been able to adjust in this map um, that have unusual shapes. Um, or encompass a wide range of demographic groups. And I'd like to talk a little more about how some of that led into our concept for um, the recommended changes map. <clears throat> uh, so again, the goal was to use the data we had on the neighborhoods to really consider uh, natural neighborhood boundaries um, and, uh, and draw maps that reflected things better in terms of uh, you know, sort of representation of a wide range of characteristic uh, characteristics from neighborhoods in, in town meeting. And again, well, not splitting any precincts based on the house district line. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, sort of this concept that we've had about natural neighborhoods. Um, so precincts that run uh, from Mass Ave to one of the borders tend to encompass a wide range of housing types and incomes. Um, and we know that um, that has um, some appeal. Residents um, gave us comments uh, in earlier phases that they liked the idea that precincts would have a mix of demographics. But the concern for the reprecincting working group um, is really the same at the local level as, uh, as at the national level, uh, people who run uh, for town meeting are often wealthier and live in single family homes. And that just raises a concern as to uh, how well the diversity of the precinct is represented in town meeting. Um, just as an example, um, if 40% of residents across Arlington uh, rent their homes, you would hope that roughly 40% of town meeting members rent their homes if you're looking for sort of representative town meeting. Um, we don't have specific data on that, but uh, I was trying to find a simple example of, of you know, sort of the, to illustrate the concern um, that we have when we start digging into the data. Uh, in our recommended map, we limited the changes as much as possible, and we only changed one additional precinct um, that uh, we didn't have to change before. Um, so it's not a comprehensive solution. It doesn't address you know, every possible um, issue that, that, uh, that we would have found across town. Um, and it would have been a little easier to draw some of these precincts um, if we had had uh, 16 instead of 21. Nevertheless, we do think this is a strong step forward, um, uh, you know, sort of using the data um, and the tools that we have in order to make improvements um, as, we, uh, as we go forward. <clears throat> so uh, same five precincts have to change. Um, so when we look at East Arlington, the major change here is um, we took the idea that this Webb Cowett neighborhood is much more similar to precinct five streets um, and it's also, you know, a Thompson School uh, neighborhood. Uh, so we pulled that into Precinct 5 out of Precinct 9. Um, part of the focus here is Precinct 9 then becomes much more largely focused along, um, along Mass Ave and sort of that more urban and dense feeling, um, very similar to Precinct 17 in order to accommodate moving the entire Webb Cowett neighborhood 
we pulled more precincts out of five and into seven, and then also made adjustments um, to move a few precincts into nine. So, you know, sort of the, the changes flow around in order to, uh, <clears throat> to balance the precincts. Um, uh, similarly, when we looked, uh, looked at this part of town, we wanted to, um, we wanted to think about precinct 15 a little differently and um, turn it into more of a, um, uh, the, the planning department often refers to something like this as a, as a transition zone. Um, the precincts to the north tend to be very um, suburban, um, lots of single family homes and not very dense. Precinct 15 is somewhat um, in the middle. And then of course, the other side of it are the much denser uh, precincts nine and 17. Um, <clears throat> and so we took, uh, we sort of shifted things around. So, uh, you know, we took population um, uh, from 15 and moved it to 13 and swapped around the bottom of 15 with 11 to create this, this new shape um, and, and sort of concept uh, so that each of the three precincts are more clearly defined and there's less, um, less mixing um, of sort of demographic uh, and you know, housing styles within each precinct. <clears throat> um, you can see um, when you glance through the filters um, uh, that are, uh, on the web page, um, you can sort of see as you as you go through, and this is a sort of a nice shot. Um, you know, there's there's real differences, and and it's nice. Um, it's just sort of nice to uh, to start recognizing that um, and adjusting uh, our precinct shapes. <clears throat> uh, in the center on this map, again, we do the same type of work, um, taking. Uh, this section out of precinct 17. Um, uh, and then, uh, so and again, precinct nine stays along Mass Ave. Um, and uh, uh, then, and we smooth out some of the, some of the other shapes. Um, so this is sort of a, a nicer map here for the center of town. Uh, and then uh, the biggest change um, difference in, in, uh, the next big issue is precincts eight and 10, um, rather than uh, having eight and 10 run uh, vertically, so to speak, um, we suggest that we run them horizontally. Um, precincts eight and 10 are fairly different um, when you sort of look at some of the data filters and this makes uh, sort of a more natural uh, division. Also, it respects sort of Gray Street, um, which divides 12 and 14, it sort of continues that along and the neighborhood uh, profiles um, really follow. Um, I'm sure you guys have lots of questions, but I didn't want to um, you know, sort of read, um, read all the words off of the slides. Um, and, um, and so, uh, and then of course, uh, there's the same change um, in precincts 16 and 18. So again, we've added um, one additional precinct. So 11 precincts uh, with a recommended map would need to elect all of their town meeting members, um, which is less, uh, well, fewer, a fewer number of precincts than um, the previous two decades, which had 15 and 13. Um, and, um, uh, and we believe that we've constructed um, better precincts that are um, positioned well for the kinds of growth and, and discussions and housing development uh, conversations that we wanna have over the next few years. Um, I'm gonna leave the presentation up for just a little bit in case it's helpful for people. Um, we can um, answer questions and, and uh, look at the maps. Great. Thank, thank you, Ms. Brazil. I'm just wondering, and I think it's helpful to leave it up. Would you mm -hmm. mind going to the page that shows the limited changes map and the recommended changes map? And it, it also shows some of the detail um, 
and if members want something in particular, that's that's fine. Um, yeah, that one there. Um, okay. Okay, and and just before I turn it to members for for questions or comments, again because of the time frame here, we have to have something in um, by Saturday. I think Ms. Brazil's right. Let's get it in ahead of that date. So. Mm -hmm. um, I view tonight, unless board members feel differently, as a night to get comments and questions on the table. We will have public participation with an eye towards making a final vote either on November 22nd or another meeting before the end of November. But whatever we do for the, for the final vote, there's going to be a short period of time that's necessary for descriptions. And I think that's the reason for the delay between a vote um, to, to accept a certain map and then the final vote with the descriptions of each, each precinct. So with that, I will um, start with the board and I'll start with Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Ms. Brazil and the precinct working group team for your continued hard work. This has been, it, this, this has been an outstanding presentation and it really shows how complex this is the, what the ripple effects are when you make a little change. And I am fully appreciative of, of the challenges. Um, we've already started, like I know at least speaking for myself as a select board member, the emails have started to come in from people who are responding to, to these uh, maps that went up on Friday. Um, I've heard some concerns that this was, uh, that they went up Friday, you know, right before our meeting. And was there people worried that this was, an, you know, an, an effort to try to, you know, not give the public much notice. And I just want to say to the public, I understand that concern and I value public input a lot. And I think it's important to just for the public to be reassured that, you know, this, the timing of that represents, uh, I'm going to guess, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Madam Clerk, represents nothing more than the groups uh, have, doing this as quickly as they could, given that the state legislative districts came through very, very recently. There's a lot of data to crunch, a lot of work to done, and Friday was when it could be done. And as the, Mr. Chair uh, said, we were not planning to vote on this for another couple of weeks. Um, is, that, is that a fair representation, uh, Ms. Brazil, of, of the reason for that timing, or is there anything you wanna add? No, yes, no, it, it, it was, uh, you know, we certainly wanted to give the, the public and the board, um, you know, some time to digest it. Um, but, uh, but um, it, it, we just, there wasn't additional time you know, in the schedule. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, you've been working very, very fast and very hard, given, you know, given the constraints. So, so thank you for that. Um, but on the topic of, of public feedback, I know that when the earlier maps, uh, including the 16 plan and other were, were being, uh, being distributed, that you and your team did an exceptional job of soliciting and collecting structured public feedback via um, the online survey forms and public meetings. And you know, I know that you're all very tired and you're still very busy and we are too, but um, what can we do between now and two weeks from now to solicit uh, broad-based public feedback? Are, you, are there plans in the works? Is there anything that we can do? Um, and the reason I ask is, you know, we're, we're really narrowing down to what we're very likely to do. And I think that people, town meeting members, but also residents, this is when they're really going to start paying attention if they feel like, okay, now we kind of know what close to where we are. I guess I better look at those boundaries. I guess I better look at these neighborhoods, look at my polling place. So a lot of people are going to be hitting this for the first time. Um, what, what, can we do to draw out as much public input to help us as the select board um, in making this decision in two weeks? I'm sure we can uh, sort of create um, a very similar Google form, uh, very simple just to let people, and then uh, you know people can continue to email you, uh, uh, the board, and certainly email uh, town clerk. Um, so yeah, we're happy to um, invite people to share, um, it'll be a, a you know a few days of comment um, so that we can have time to um, you know sort of digest it and uh, do any fine tuning um, that uh, around issues that are raised. Yeah, thank you, thank you for what, whatever you can do that. And um, um, 
I would uh, might maybe suggest that um, on his part, the town manager would, you know, might look at any way to assist that, that effort. I think it's just, speaking for myself anyway, it's really important to get public feedback at this really critical stage. Um, um, and I know the town communications efforts for, you know, for sending out notices can be, certainly be used uh, to promote sure. that. Great. Um, I, and I appreciate um, noting that, you know, there's always winners and losers, so to speak, you know, with this and that some people will have um, arguably worse uh, changes in, in their polling locations. Um, and that transparency is, is, is welcome because that's just how this works. Um, I'm curious, you know, you, I think you, you said before correctly that we can, the select board can change polling locations at any time over the next 10 years. And we certainly have a history of doing that when we can. Um, have you had the opportunity in working with these maps, other than just sort of knowing that that's something that can be done, have you had the opportunity to do any project, any perspective thinking to like look at potential solutions where uh, polling places could be moved that would, that would alleviate these at all? Or, or is it more just kind of, we hope that, you know, that that, that might be a solution? We have not done uh, a lot of detailed work on that simply because it's a separate process. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and in some ways it's easier to do it as a separate step. Um, if you try to solve two problems at once, I'm afraid you make too many compromises around the edges. Um, yeah. um, so that's a real concern. I mean, the, the quickest overview is um, some of the best solutions would be to have as many polling places along the center of town. Um, so, you know, really look at um, being able to use the high school um, and, uh, and, you know, and the Gibbs, um, you know, ideally we don't wanna increase the total number of precincts a lot that adds expense um, and, you know, sort of overhead logistics. But, um, but I suspect um, there, there are several, you know, several, solution paths that will um, lead to improvements for um, for a lot of people. Yeah, excuse me, you have, Mr. Helmuth, Ms. Lyman, did you wanna to add to that answer? Or oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I think just to add one thing that we have, you know, we have discussed in the development of both of these maps is there are times when, you know, some of these precincts only need to shift by a few blocks. And when you're trying to pick which block moves, you're trying to, you're, you're considering the overall numbers, but you're also looking at, if we moved this block, would it retain its polling location, its like historical polling location, or would that shift? And if it would retain a historical polling location, then that would be the block that would shift instead of one that would maybe have to move to its polling location to a different, completely different part of you know the area. So it, it was a consideration. It's just not; it wasn't like the driving force, but it's definitely something that I think we've all had in our minds as we've gone forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for, for uh, pointing out uh, Ms. Lenham has raised hand. I didn't see it on my Zoom screen. Um, another question I have is, uh, I noticed that in, in the report, there was a table that, that expressed the percentage of, res of non-white residents in various scenarios. And I wonder if a, a member of the, of the team would want to speak to uh, that consideration and the degree to which um, that kind of work went into the drawing of the of the recommended changes map. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Kurowski might have um, the quickest answer since he spent most most time with the data. Sure. Thank you, uh, Ms. Brazil and, and Mr. Helmuth for the question. Uh, the table that's in front of you is a summary table, and it does create a column, uh, two columns that represent non-white population. And for size of the table, uh, the, it's kind of a summary of how we looked at non-white population. But in drawing the map, we separated GIS data layers into Asian population, Black population, and Hispanic population so that we could see more uh, variation across the community in drawing our boundaries. And um, so this, this table isn't necessarily representative of the entire GIS analysis that we did. <clears throat> the maps that are online <clears throat> uh, represent the, the more detailed data layers and the various considerations that we took into account, especially along the Mass Ave corridor, uh, where these populations um, 
uh, tend to live in, in higher numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, that, that, that's helpful. Um, yeah, I think in, in the, over the next couple of weeks, I would be interested in hearing more when there's, you know, there's more time, I'm happy to talk offline, you know, about, about what, what the, a little bit more about what the thinking is here and if that, you know, drove some of the, uh, of the thinking about precinct boundaries or if that's more descriptive, I think that's kind of what I'm, what I'm getting at. Um, but I'm not sure my question is fully formed, so I'll, I'll hold off and ask a better question and, and uh, maybe consult with, with some of you later. Um, I think that's all I have now. I want to give my colleagues a, a full chance to, to have at it and hear from the public as well. So thank you so much for your responses and for your work. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, Mrs. Mahan. Um, first, I'd like to move a seat, if that's appropriate, Mr. Chairman. And um, my question is, um, through the chair, um, or to the chair, <laughs> or to uh, town council, that um, is my understanding correct that um, the ultimate decision makers on this issue are the uh, town clerk, town moderator, and the board administrator from the select board. For, for, for the outline of the, the, the of each precinct, Mrs. Mahan? Um, for the, the ultimate decision of what, of what the, the 21 precincts will be and what those districts will be. Uh, Attorney Hunt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Mon, I believe, I believe the, the ultimate decision is the select words. Okay. And so um, they're, they're, I'm sorry. No, please go ahead. So they're, they're proposing something to you, but ultimately the um, any change in precincts is ultimately approved by the board, ultimately rests with the board authority. And um, if I can, Mr. Chair, um, asking Attorney Heim to read into my mind, why do I have um, that the town moderator, town clerk, and board administrator have a role in this? Do they or do they not? Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, may I? Yes, go right ahead. Thank you, Ms. Mon. I think reading into my understanding of, of how some of these things uh, took place in the past, um, my, if my read of some prior memos that I perused at different points in time, I think there were some instances where the state had um, made some suggestions and the timeline was even shorter than we have at present for a variety of reasons. And the board administrator, then town clerk and moderator were among a sort of task group, not that different from uh, the group the clerk assembled here to sort of try to look at the paper maps and um, parse out uh, what changes made sense to them. I, Mr. Krauske, you may have been present for that um, discussion the last time this happened. I could be wrong about that, but I had heard some anecdotal evidence that you were, you were present. That might illuminate uh, the situation further, Ms. Mahan. But I, I, just to be clear, I, I think that they, they may have been making recommendations, um, but the select board was ultimately taking the vote. Uh, yes, and Mr. Krawski has any knowledge of that? And if he doesn't, that's okay. Sure, and just to clarify, the, the uh, you'd like a summary of how this occurred last time? Yes, last time. And which I believe was previous times. I just wanna make sure we're covering all the bases. Sure, yeah, so that would have been in 2011 this occurred. Uh, the last census was 2010. Uh, so about a year after that, we conducted this similar review. And at that time, um, I would say less communities in Massachusetts had GIS. So uh, one of the clear deliverables and methods that could be used by a community was a paper map review. And uh, we were just starting our GIS program at the time, and the, uh, the management of this uh, came down to a, a shorter timeline. So we did do an internal paper map review that included a similar group to which we have now, planning the clerk's office and the board of selectmen, 
uh, with recommendations of minor changes by the state, which we essentially adopted. And it was my recollection that it was the select board that ultimately approved this um, and uh, was also headed up by the clerk's office as well. So I, I actually don't recall who was the final signature of it, but uh, both were involved. Okay. Um, so I guess I would, um, since this will appear on a November agenda, just reiter reiterate my motion for receipt um, and to continue to tax the <laughs> Precincting working group under, under the town clerk, but also I would like um, uh, when this appears on our next agenda that we also have um, a recommendation, which I assume would be the same or probably would be the same from the town clerk, town moderator, and um, select board administrator. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. I'll second the motion. I also want to thank our town clerk, town staff, and the precinct working group. As we have these presentations and sift through the data, my head spins at the amount of work that I think is involved in uh, getting our precincts to comply with the requirements and uh, better you all than me. But I do want to thank all the work that comes into this. And, you know, we do have, we've got a number of comments already on these, the two proposals, like our town clerk said, sometimes change is hard, um, but we'll take some time to take a look at these and really absorb the presentations and see and just move forward with what's best for the town as a whole. Um, one question that I did have, and I apologize if this was covered in the presentation, I know it said that uh, under the recommended change, 11 precincts will have to rerun for the town meeting spots under the recommended map. Under the limited change map, how many precincts would have to rerun for their town meeting spots? I could answer that. Yep. Sure, you could go right ahead. Sure, 10. 10, okay, so some arms. And then to borrow some language from my colleague, uh, Mr. Diggins, I have a curiosity question on the recommended change map. Do I see in precinct nine, is there a portion of precinct nine that's separated from the rest of the precinct on the upper right hand portion of the map? Um, it looks like a little yellow portion. Oh, sorry, let's get to the recommended changes. Um, Ms. Brazil, I could answer that question. Yeah, this section, yep. Um, this, uh, the areas that we get to work with in order to uh, define our precincts are called census blocks. Yeah. And unfortunately, census blocks kind of end up like Tetris blocks where there are these really strange shapes. And that block that you're speaking of, Mr. Hurd, is actually a really long, thin block that's on the lake side and the river side of Mystic Valley Parkway where no one actually lives. And Miss Brazil's green cursor is actually on the block that you're speaking of. So if you can see, it kind of is like a hockey stick in, and hooks around the Webb Coet neighborhood. So if we put it in precinct nine, it will look like it's got a strange hook on it. And if we put it in precinct five on this map, it will look like a strange uh, panhandle of sorts that goes between the cemetery and the lake. So unfortunately, some of these census blocks are these really strange uh, uh, geographies and they actually don't have any folks in them. Um, so they, they do have these odd tails. So it is contiguous, but it did look strange on that map that you were referencing where there was a side-by-side -side comparison. Yeah, thank you for the explanation. I just was wondering why there was one particular po portion of the of precinct nine that seemed separated, but appreciate that. Uh, like I said, you know, I thank you for all the work that's put into this and we'll take the next couple of weeks to really absorb the data, reach out to the members of the working group and the town clerk as necessary with any questions that we have and look forward to our next meeting on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. And before I turn to Mr. Diggins, and just on that last point, Mr. Kroska, I think I, I saw a similar situation. It was contiguous in 
the recommendation for precinct 10, there's a, it looks like there's a stretch of land between Route 2 and Spy Pond. No one lives there, but it, it shows up in, in the precinct 10 uh, map. You can see it there. In the, in the lower left. So, I, 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 and thank you for that explanation. A lot of people, as they were providing us feedback, um, it, it is really hard with the job that you have to do because of the census blocks that you have to take in and then with the legislative districts at, as well. So, I'm sorry for taking that time right now, Mr. Diggins. That's quite all right, Mr. Chair. And, and you know, what I love about other people's curiosity questions is usually. It isn't a question that I've thought of myself, but nonetheless, I'm, I'm fascinated by the question. I'm really happy you asked it, Mr. Hearn. Uh, and so, um, let's see, uh, I, re I request um, to uh, the clerk, um, Mr. Chair, through you. Uh, yes. Do so you think we could get, uh, like you did with the, the, the race um, on the charts, an income um, um, breakdown on the chart, a chart form of that? Um. I believe that information is posted online um, so that you can look at the filters and if, if particular screenshots of comparisons would be happy, we can certainly do that, yeah. Oh, if it's already online, that's fine. I'll just go and get it myself, so great, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, uh, and um, let's see. Uh, oh, so um, I mean, feel oh, free to say I'm sorry, Ms. Brazil, um, I know Adam, or I could probably address that too, especially regarding income. Adam, do you want to go ahead? Sorry. Um, we Income isn't available at the level of detail that we could provide on the chart because the income, um, some of these, some of these characteristics, while we can show them on a map and we can show blocks so almost like a, like a, like a heat map of where income is above or below median income, et cetera. Um, it isn't available at the, it's only available at the block group level, which is not as detailed as what you see here. And these, these little red lines are in the block level. And so at sometimes a block group will cross a precinct boundary. And so then it sort of muddies up our ability to create a chart with that data. Adam, gotcha. I don't know if there's anything else I missed there, but that, so there are certain things like race and ethnicity that we can show in that chart. We can show population in that chart, um, but we can't show things that are in the American Community Survey data because that's only available at the block group, not the block. All right, great. Well then, I won't go looking for it. Thank you. And uh, so, uh, uh, and so uh, maybe this is something that you just don't um, feel that you should deal with. Uh, how, how do you recommend that we deal with the potential issue? impact on FinCom? There is no impact on FinCom, it's 21 precincts. Oh, in terms of, we'll need to map, sorry, you're right. We would need to map the location of each person um, and work out, um, you know, if, if a section uh, if a section is changed, then it's possible there would now be two current members um, from the same precinct um, under the new map and we would have to we'd have to get that list um, together. Right, I mean, so as I've said several times, I mean, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I just find it worrisome, bothersome. I'm trying to come up with a fairly tame word, meaning that uh, we seemingly can't do much I mean, because of the impact of FinCom. It just seems that I mean, that can't be what prevents us from making positive changes. And, and if for some reason, you know, that becomes a reason we don't do something this time that we feel we should do, then we really need to put some um, steps, take some steps to make sure that when uh, we get to uh, 10 years from now, we, that we've warned the folks who are gonna be dealing that they need to take some steps beforehand need to make sure that potential impacts on FinCom are resolved. Um, and so the last thing is with respect to more comments, I mean, um, what I'm really interested in is the response to the comments. I mean, uh, I mean we're gonna get lots of email. I mean, and for me, it's not the number of times I hear an argument. I mean, it's really the quality of the argument and the response to it that's going to determine I me mean, how I feel about something. So I me mean, to the extent we do get comments, it would be really helpful if I could see 
um, responses to the comments mean that you that, that you choose to, to respond to. I'm not going to dictate me to request that you respond to everything, but there, there are those arguments that you know that he, it would be helpful me for us, me, and maybe the residents at large, me, to see uh, the response to. So I, I, that's my request. And, and I don't, I guess we can't really, no, I'm going to stop at this point. So thank you. That's it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. And um, before I turn to the public, I would like to thank Ms. Brazil and all the members of the um, Reprecincting Working Group. This has been a, a lot of work that, that, that you've undertaken since earlier this year, throughout the summer and in over the last few months. And there's been different iterations that you've had to work with. And, and we really appreciate all the time and effort that you have put into this. And, and as I look at um, what's being proposed here too, I appreciate the fact that uh, from discussions and I think feedback that, that, that you received that to the extent that a precinct didn't need to change, I think there was a sentiment, um, let's not change it to, to, to have everybody run again. And, and I, I, I think you have followed that. Um, I am starting to get comments as all the members are. And, and right now, most of the comments I've received are people in precincts 11 and 13 where things have changed and, and also precincts eight and 10. And I just am wondering briefly, you have put in some of the reasons for changing the um, proposed configuration of eight and 10. So it Gray Street becomes a dividing line as opposed to an orientation from Mass Ave to route two. Is there anything further you want to add on that? That there seems to be a lot of discussion on that. And I, I just want to give you an opportunity if there's anything further that that you saw that that um, maybe wasn't in the slide that led you to the recommendation. Uh, no, I mean I think uh, I think the 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 housing demographics um, are you know sort of very clear. Um, the extending of the dividing line is very clear. And um, in some senses this wasn't considered um, a, a, you know, a, 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 this wasn't the more difficult recommendation simply because um, precincts eight and 10 would, could continue to vote at the same location. Um, so we're not disrupting uh, the residents terribly. We, we do understand it, it, um, it disrupts some of the uh, town meeting members. Um, um, uh, I mean, they'd have to run anyway uh, because we have to rebalance eight. Um, and 10 in terms of population. Um, I guess I will say if we looked, we, we, did, uh, we did sort of start to look at the addresses um, of town meeting members um, and, uh, and you know, precinct eight um, had, um, if, you, if you graphed them and compared them on this map, precinct eight had fewer town meeting members than precinct 10. And so that was our concern is that, um, is that if you divide them vertically, um, you have more representation in this part um, than you do in this part. Um, and so the voices of these people on certain bylaw and zoning changes um, is, uh, is potentially, uh, you know, sort of not as well uh, represented in town meeting. Um, so I think that's, that's, you know, there's a lot of layers to the data that we looked at, um, if that answers your question. Sure. No, that, that, that's fine. Thank you. And can I, I also- ask, Can I oh, go ahead. ask one clarifying question? Um, sure. I uh, have not received uh, to the town clerk email any specific um, feedback on the maps. So in order, to, um, in order to absorb the data and respond to the data, both to the public and to the board, um, uh, I'll, I'll definitely um, work with the, uh, administrative staff on um, the select board office to make sure that that we're getting um, we're getting those emails um, summarized and sent to us uh, so that we can work with them. Okay, that's um, great. Yeah, and, and and most of them, at least in my experience, came in since Friday when the agenda item was was posted. Um, Ms. Lineman, did you want to add to that uh, response? Yeah, I think just the one additional charge that we were given um, both by the state and just as part of this overall process was to not only consider our demographics, uh, the demographic information we have right now, but to also look at, I mean, these precincts will cover the town for the next 10 years. So we, we do have a responsibility to think about change. Um, and part of the changes that are proposed in our recommended map on eight and 10 
and also on 11 and 13, are thinking about the kinds of changes that are most likely to happen to the town and where those changes might, based on changes that have happened to date, where those changes are most likely to occur. So part of what we are also trying to do is anticipate change over the next 10 years and identify precincts that maybe 10 years from now may not need to have so much change because they're designed in such a way now to accommodate that growth and change in the next 10 years. Great, thank, thank, thank you. Um, all right, so now I, I did say we would take public um, comment on this and so I'll open it up to, to the public. I believe there are a couple of hands raised now, if anybody else would like to speak, if they could show uh, by raising their hands. And I believe Paul Schlickman is the first person. Correct. Thank you. I'll promote okay. him. Thank you very much. I, I'm very impressed by the work of uh, the town clerk and the committee on, on these maps. Uh, I would, would say that the preferred map is preferred for some very good reasons. And it's been very thoughtful in terms of having a coherent and thoughtful uh, description of the precincts that, that need to change. That said, precinct nine would move to be a linear mass ave precinct. And in order to uh, put the uh, polling place for precinct nine in a central location for this new precinct, uh, particularly under the preferred map, uh, a lot of folks in the precinct live across the street or a uh, short walk to town hall. And I would hope that if the either map is adopted or particularly the uh, preferred map, uh, Precinct 9's polling place should be at Town Hall and not the Bishop's School. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, Charles Foskett is next. Is Mr. Foskett still with us, sir? Yeah, you know, I think what happens is when I promote someone to attendee, they they have to accept the promotion. So if he's not actively sitting in front of his screen, he might not be able to do that. Okay. Um, all right. Why don't we go to the next speaker and we can return to Mr. Foskett unless you, yeah, I don't, it doesn't look like he's. Okay. Next, the next speaker is Elizabeth Dre. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Dre. Just need you to unmute your microphone. <laughs> Gosh, Elizabeth Dre. Um, Elizabeth Dre. I want to uh, thank you so much um, to the working group, to Ms. Brazil. Um, these maps are look really great. Um, and also I want to thank uh, Don Seltzer for his work on these maps. Um, I'm relieved to that not all 21 precincts are involved. So that was like a big sigh of relief. And I came tonight really open to hearing the discussion um, because I'm gonna have to run no matter what. So I, I, I'm in. Um, what I, I didn't really get to dig into the maps until this evening. And so one of the things that I would love some feedback about, and I know you can't respond now, so maybe I can email Ms. Brazil, um, but one of the biggest goals that was originally um, discussed what, by the reprecinting group was about like the DEI goals, right? About, about um, having these communities of interests and making sure to see if they could sort of be kept together to give them more voting power, something like that, right? But um, what I don't see on this presentation is any, information about those goals anymore. I see that they're 
there's information provided about race um, and one, sli one slide about density, um, but there isn't any information to say which of these two maps is better at preserving and maintaining those community of communities of interest. Um, I know that it's stated that race, income, and tenure were part of the decision making and that the goals were to consider race and home ownership and but there's no data to support whether which of these maps gives us the best that that that, that achieves that the best. Um, and then when I did dig in, when I looked at the different precincts, so in the recommended map, in the limited map, 10 change, in the recommended map, 11 change. So if we just look at those 10 that have to change in either one, three stay the same. So there, those are constant. Of the other seven, five of those have less, have a decrease in the non-white percentage. So they are more white than in the recommended map than they are in the limited map. And so to me, without knowing more, the recommended map does a, does a less good job <laughs> of um, concentrating um, or, or, or protecting the racial groups. And then we don't have information about age, homeownership, or income. So we, we, we can't compare those. So, oh, I'm over time. I just... Um, want to say I understand the time constraints that you were under with the working group, but I would love if possible to have these maps out as quickly as possible so that the public has a big robust time to respond. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ms. Frey. Mr. Chairman. And, and, and I think just before we go to the next speaker, just, and I think those questions, as, as Ms. Frey said, I mean, those, I, I think they'll probably be follow up with the clerk's office or, or with the clerk herself on that. Good. Okay. Thank you. All right, um, who's next, Mr. Chaplain? So there's a hand raised by Don Seltzer and Joanne Preston has once again messaged me asking uh, if she could speak. Okay, so why don't we turn to um, Mr. Seltzer and then um, Ms. Preston after. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, I can provide an immediate answer to a question that was asked a little earlier about the impact on FinCom. Um, with the second map that was presented, six of our precincts will be without any FinCom members. Uh, three of them will have two FinCom members and one precinct will have four FinCom members. So you might want to take that into your consideration. Um, as a long-term resident of Precinct 8, I wish to disagree with the characterization of what constitutes neighborhoods in, that, in this area. Um, I think many of my fellow Precinct 8 and Precinct 10 um, neighbors will agree that our natural neighbors, uh, neighborhoods tend to run north-south from Mass Ave down to Route 2, and splitting it up horizontally does not represent uh, a natural neighborhood for us. Um, I think you've received some correspondence from Elizabeth Pyle, which expresses that far more um, eloquently than I can um, as to the reasons why that is true. In fact, I hope that all the correspondence that you received on this will eventually be posted as correspondence to the select board um, on this matter. Um, the other thing that I wanna point out that disruption comes not only from having a number of precinct town meeting members have to run again next spring, the real disruption comes from the fact that with scrambling around these precincts, you're going to end up with very different um, precincts as far as their constituencies. The limited change options generally keep most precincts to within 95% of the, 
of their um, current um, constituency. The ones that are being recommended are splitting lots of precincts in two and then shuffling around with other precincts. So they look very little like the current precincts do now. And the town meeting members are unevenly distributed between them. So you're gonna have cases where certain precinct members, town meeting members currently are simply going to be forced out. There will be no seats for them. That is particularly true in precincts eight and 10 um, or precinct um, 10 where there are going to be 15 current town meeting members competing for only 12 seats next spring. So three current town meeting members, generally long serving, capable, knowledgeable are gonna be forced out because there's no room for them. So please take that into your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. And just on your point on the correspondence, what we do is anything received before the agenda is published, we will put as correspondence received. What we receive from the date the agenda is published through tonight's meeting, we will post after the fact to the um, that the, the record of the meeting. Just 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 in response to that question, that's what we've been doing on this issue, where we get things after the initial publication, but we will add those letters to the record. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Um, I want to point out though that I've written to the board a couple times in the past over the last month, and none of those correspondences has appeared in the official record. Okay. All right. We'll work on that. Sorry. I'm about sure that. it was an and, oversight. Thank that's you. right. Thank thank you. Uh, okay, uh, is it in Joanne Preston is the next, Mr. Chaplain? Correct, and uh, one more hand has been raised after her. Good evening again, Ms. Preston. Almost there. I see. I see. I see her on the screen, but I don't know if the connection has been made yet. I'm sorry. Okay. Now you can hear me. <laughs> yes, we can. I live in the Webb Cowan neighborhood, which is a very cohesive neighborhood, which has been lopped off of Precinct 9 and attached to some other precinct much larger on the other side of Medford Street. And um, my neighbors are just beginning to find out about this. Um, I'd like to say as a social scientist that demographic data is not always what forms a neighborhood. And that our interest in the environment and trees and pedestrian safety we have in common with other parts of Precinct 9, especially the housing authorities. And we've been working with them on the Chestnut Street issue and other issues. Um, so income does not make a neighborhood. A community of interest makes a neighborhood. Um, we haven't heard or seen or I'm not sure I know more than three people in the precinct that you're attaching us to on the other side of Medford Street. But um, I would like very much for the Precinct 9 to stay together as a coherent group, as it has been working for that. Just because we're further down Medford Street doesn't mean most of the people in Webb Cowett neighborhood actually walk up through the to Mass Ave where the bookstore is, the coffee houses, the bus, everything. So they have much more of a community than whoever might live across the other side of Medford Street that is closer to the river, not the part up by Mass Ave. So I, I think very seriously, we should take more time 
to ask what makes a community. It's hard for these hardworking four people to know every community and what makes it cohesive and every neighborhood in Arlington. So I just like to add, I, I think it would be, it would be very disruptive to take our little neighborhood, which has been working with the housing authorities and other people a little further up on Medford Street and attach them to the other so people who live on the other side of Medford Street. Um, they have not worked with us on any of these issues as have the other people in Precinct 9. So um, I'm not quite sure why this is, I guess, what is referred to as the recommended plan, but that is not true of the limited change plan. Is that the, I would call it my recommended plan that we are still attached to the rest of Precinct 9 and could continue to work with the people on the issues that are important to us. Uh, so uh, as you might hear from people in the Webb Cowett neighborhood, but that is my uh, analysis of what would be a cohesive community to just lop us off from the people we've been working with on these issues, I think would not be in the spirit of preserving neighborhoods and communities of interest. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Preston. Mr. Chairman, there's now uh, three hands raised. Uh, the next speaker would be Patricia Warden. Okay. And, yeah, and actually, before we go, whether it's Mrs. Warden or Mr. Warden, I see the three names. Um, why don't we cut it off at that we do we have given opportunity for people to raise their hand. So I you know there's three more speakers, but uh, just in the interest of time, that will be it this evening on the uh, public comment. But we encourage people to reach out to us directly and reach out through the clerk's office uh, and the reprecinct being working group too as we go through the next couple of weeks. Um, and I see it's Mr. Warden. So uh, Mr. Warden, if you can hear us, um, uh, go right ahead. I can hear you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, John Warden, uh, town meeting member, precinct eight. Um, uh, historical note, I was moderator in when the precincts were re rearranged in, in uh, 2001, no, yeah, yes, 2001 and one in, in 1991. And I was I tell you that the moderator was uh, not involved in that uh, process and uh, knew practically nothing about it. Um, I, I, I want to, uh, as you know, I've written, as you may know, if you read the have read the correspondence I've written to the board on more than one occasion, I've spoken to the board uh, on this issue, um, very much in favor of the limited, uh, uh, I call it the limited disruption plan. Uh, seems to be largely based on Mr. Seltzer's uh, plan. Um, and um, <clears throat> it's uh, there's a couple of reasons I'd like to cite for that. Uh, one, uh, the school district, the, the pre present precinct eight is largely in the Bishop School District, because we used to have our own school parmenter. Um, the, where, whereas the precinct 10 folks are, are, or children are mostly in the Brackett School District. Um, so and the, 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 we don't have children uh, of that age anymore. We once did, um, but um, those school, school groups and PTAs, PTOs uh, are, are, are good cohesive neighborhood groups and uh, therefore changing the precincts uh, as in the recommended plan, it doesn't make any sense in that, that regard. We noticed that, that the, the, uh, the, the, all the apartment buildings seem to be placed in the new precinct eight uh, and none of them in the new precinct 10, whereas before they were divided. Uh, I point out that a lot of these apartment buildings are, are condominiums. Uh, and so I don't know if that makes them, that makes them homes or, or, or what. But there's also a lot of uh, 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 rental, uh, 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 rental in two family homes, three family homes, 
pre-existing uh, buildings and, and single family zones, et cetera. Um, so uh, that's, I, I don't know why that, that particular choice was made. Again, the, the uh, sort of east-west division doesn't seem to make much sense. And it shouldn't be a surprise that people of more wealth are, are, are more likely to be candidates for people less wealth. That goes right from the presidency right down to town meeting members. People have, are better off or better positioned uh, to do this. And uh, think of a case where somebody running for the, the Senate or the House of Representatives or anything didn't have a very substantial pocketbook and a lot of packs behind him or her. Um, and and, um, and I, I feel very uncomfortable when I see some of these things. That, you know, it seems this this thing, well, these are, we got this, this many white people, we got this many non-white people. We got this many apartment dwellers who are deemed to be poor, and we have this many single homeowners who are deemed to be rich. You know, it ain't necessarily so. I know from work I do with the charitable farmer trust that, that we have we have elderly women who own their single family homes, and but but they need help because one thing the taxes are so high, um, and we help them. Uh, um, excuse me, Mr. Warden, if you can wrap up, you're you're at about three and a half minutes right now. Okay, uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. But I, I just want to say that the idea of of uh, uh, making these kind of decisions and judgments, that's not the American way. We all live together, rich, rich or poor, black or white, whatever. And, and I don't think it should be any part of any decision. So stick with the limited yeah. disruption plan. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Warden. We're now, we're now down to one speaker, uh, Mr. Foskett. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, good evening, Mr. Foskett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Charles Foskett, town meeting member of Precinct 8. I'm also chair of the Finance Committee. First of all, I want to thank Mr. Diggins and Mr. Seltzer for their comments on the concerns about disruption of the Finance Committee. I think that uh, Mr. Seltzer uh, nailed it. The, the devastation is actually mo more in this version of the recommended plan than in prior plans. However, I would like to speak to you personally as a, as a citizen of the town, not as a chair of the Finance Committee, but as a citizen of the town and a member of Precinct 8 as a town meeting member. I'm very concerned about the entire approach that Mr. Zia has presented. Excuse me, Mr. Foskett. I, I, we're having a little trouble hearing you. I don't know if you can adjust your microphone. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm using, using an, is that any better? That's much better. Okay, uh, I'm very concerned about the proposals that Ms. Brazil has presented and the criteria that she has used. She's used terms, I've heard the terms more coherent, fair. I'd like to know what are the criteria for, for, the, for these comments? The, uh, you know, my, my concern is that the standards that she's brought forth aren't arising from the Arlington electorate. They're not arising from the normal process that we followed in Arlington, where citizens get together and present issues, dis discuss them, debate them. This has come from a small group of people, only one of which is represents the citizens as, as an elected official, the rest are employees of the town. Uh, basically, I don't think that the, the uh, re precinct working group represents the, the citizens of the town. Uh, I'm very, as Mr. Warden just mentioned, I'm, I'm very concerned about this divisive um, discussion about homeowners versus rentals and uh, racial discrimination and wealth versus non-wealth, suburban versus urban. These are, these are distinctions that I've never heard before in Arlington. This is, this is subjectively, I asked the select board to think about what is our community? How do you want to see our community go forward in the next 10 years? Is it according to these criteria that have been projected upon us by, I don't know who it is exactly, but this is not the, the town that I know and love. Um, Ms. Brazil also said she wants to, um, I wrote the notes here, she wants to set things up so that we can have the conversations that we need to have over the next few years. Well, who are we in her terms? And what are these conversations? And how do they affect the, outlook, the layout of these precincts? 
I think we have to have, before we make any, so, and I'm not speaking for the finance committee here, I'm speaking as a town meeting member in, in precinct eight. I think we have to have a much more extensive discussion with many more citizens involved and many more town meeting members involved to determine exactly what it is we're trying to, what, what it, it is she's trying to achieve. Candidly, the position that has been taken here makes me want to see the position of town clerk stay elected and not go to become under the town manager because it's too important not to be responsive to the voters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Foskett. Is there anybody, I believe why well, I actually said that was it, right? That with those, those three speakers. Um, okay, so I will, I don't know if there's any board members that have any final comments. Um, I Just by a show of hands, I won't, I won't call names. I, I don't know if anybody wants to speak any further. I think we have laid out the time period. We will come back on the 22nd. We'll ask for as much input as we can and um, I think we also will try to coordinate through the clerk's office and the town manager's office to um, get additional information out to town meeting members as well. Ms. Brazil, I see your hand up. Yeah, I, 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 wanna, I wanna clarify the timing is, um, is tight um, in that on the 22nd, the select board 100% has to pick a map. So, if there are any suggestions based on the feedback that you have that you would like the reprecincting group to model for you, uh, we, we can't get that information fast enough. Um, so um, so we'll, um, we'll work uh, very hard to coordinate all of that. We're, we're, we're all good at that in town hall, um, but, but I wanna be sure that it's, that it's very clear. Um, we can't pull this off, uh, um, I mean, without, a whole series of, of um, special meetings convened just to, to tackle all of this. If if you don't have enough information uh, to make that final um, map choice, and then there is a second final choice, uh, the second final vote to certify the whole package um, as accurate and the whole and the entire plan. So I just want to be sure that's really clear as we map out our strategy um, for the next two weeks. Yeah, no, no, thank you for that. Absolutely. And you and I have spoken and have committed yep. that I am, I have no problem. I'm, the other members may not <laughs> care for this, but I have no problem adding additional, an additional meeting um, if that's necessary to get the work done and, and, and to, to complete things so that we have plenty of time to submit this. I appreciate that because the 22nd will be here before you know it, but if need be, we will add um, meetings to allow all the work to be completed. Um, Mr. Diggins? Yes, and um, so um, a couple things. It, it, it's um, expanding, making things more accessible being to more people. Um, it, it may be hard to, define it and I'm all about the definitions I mean I'm willing to do that work you know, uh, if not in time for the time that the time that we need to, need to make the decision then certainly afterwards and that is in anticipation of having to do this again you know, but but um we the status quo is generally comfortable with itself you know, uh, and for those in the status quo who are looking to change it, it, um, they will often run into uh, a lot of obstacles and obstacles that tend to get angry uh, and, and use all sorts of terms uh, to make people who are trying to change it um, um, feel less than positive. Uh, and, and I'll also say with respect to um, staff working on this, you know, what I have realized is that if staff tends to identify um, more strongly with this term, this town, I think, than most residents do because we, um, they work here being 40 hours a week being, and they work on behalf of the town. Uh, their, their, their livelihoods and their careers are really based on making this town better. Being, and they, 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 I would say any one of them being, knows um, more about this town than, than 
any handful of residents. And that even includes town meeting members, Mead. So, so just because they're staff, I mean, doesn't uh, make them less valuable in this process. In fact, it makes them really valuable. And I would trade their input, me for just about anybody else's input in this process. So I said, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, anybody, any other board members wish to, or Mrs. Mahan? Just if I could, um, very, very briefly for me, but um, whatever amount of time uh, she can afford us. I, I'm just curious um, in terms of Ms. Harvey, our diversity inclusion equity director, if there's any advice, insight, or anything you feel you would you could impart upon us hearing what you heard tonight as we go forward. Ms. Harvey. Um, I think right now I would suggest that we get the feedback. We're going to get a feedback form up and kind of go from there because we value community input. But I also think, like Julie started with it, change is hard. But if the town is committed to making it a better place for everyone, change needs to happen. Um, and I think the biggest change right now is not dropping down to 16 precincts, starting with what we have. And going from there, taking into consideration what community members do want, but also not just the same community members that we always hear from. We need to kind of branch out and make sure that we're reaching other people. So maybe that's the call to our current town meeting members to go out into their current precincts and share all this information so that the most amount of residents are getting it so that they can make informed um, suggestions and recommendations. And I, I just guess kind of following up on that, do you feel um, uh, do you feel that um, things that we all need to really hear that um, you're okay with saying it and, and suggesting to us, or do you feel that um, the message is being delivered and received? Um, and we can continue to go forward on that path. I just want to make sure that um, in terms of um, considering, you know, equity and diversity that um, we're giving everyone the opportunity and are we giving you all the tools that you need to have to hear that insight? Um, honestly, <laughs> no, I think in general, and it's not just with this project, it's in general, there's a larger community engagement issue um, that we don't reach all the community members that we need to reach. So that's something that's on my personal agenda to start working on moving forward. But I think with this process in particular, the tight timeline and the way it's unfortunately had to go and pumping things out as soon as this working group can has made it very difficult to try and even get all of the outreach that's needed. We've done the best we can. I think it's, it needs to be a community effort. Um, and I don't think we're fully seeing that. We're seeing pockets of it. But if everyone gets on board, and like I said, if we can use town meeting members to also spread the word that we want that feedback, I think that would help. Um, and I think that what you asked about tools, um, <laughs> Honestly, I don't, <laughs> I think we just need to hear from people and mm -hmm. it, it's a tough, it's a tough thing to crack because we all have the same issue about getting feedback. Um, okay, and that's okay. So, so maybe in the future, if you could advise us on what are the best outreach tools, not only for you, but for the mm -hmm. select board, um, just knowing where I grew up and we call it the zoo, but it's called, it's Monotomy Manor. Um, I know the mentality from there, but um, maybe going forward, um, if you could, A, let us know what outreach tools um, that you would deem beneficial, as well as what out, out, outreach tools for the board that we could and should utilize 
um, to ha help in that endeavor. And I, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic or critis critical or anything like that, but you know, we all know better, but we all need to do better, so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, and I don't see any other hands up for board members. Okay. I, and again, I want to thank the Reprecincting Working Group again for all the work you've done. There have been a tremendous amount of challenges here because we didn't know what was happening at the state level. Things changed so dramatically and um, it really impacted the work that you needed to do. What We, we all knew we had to complete precinct maps, whether it was the end of November or by December 15th, but we didn't know how that was going to go. And, and, you know, with all the changes day by day, it fell upon you to, to um, put together recommendations. And we appreciate that. We appreciate all the work that you've done in, in the, um, making the recommendations to us. And we will work through this over, over the next couple of weeks. And I think to, to Mrs. Mahan's point and, and what Ms. Harvey said too, it really is important for town meeting members to reach out to constituents too, because the time is so limited. We wanna hear from as many people as possible over the next two weeks. So we'll try to facilitate that through our office and try to work with the town manager's office and the clerk's office on that as well. So thank you uh, for being with us tonight and we will have you on the agenda on November 22nd and I'm sure there'll be dialogue between now and then. So, um, on this point, we have a motion to receive from Mrs. Mahan that was seconded by Mr. Hurd. Uh, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmer? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Jacorsi? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Okay. Thank you all. Okay, the next two items we will take together, um, items 13 and 14. Item 13 is a vote for the date for the 2022 annual town election. And item 14 for approval is the opening of the warrant for the annual 2022 town meeting. Um, I'll turn to attorney Heim. He provided us with a memo just to briefly go through um, uh, the, the, the two items and then the potential recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll work backward and I'll try to be brief. Under the town bylaws, the annual election is supposed to be held on the first Saturday in April. That's April 2nd, 2022. Um, unlike some of the recent previous elections, I don't, to my knowledge, but I know the town clerks here, I know that the select board's always got a keen eye for this type of thing. I don't see a conflict with the April 2nd date, unless I'm mistaken. So uh, typically the board has held it on the First Saturday in April, unless there's been a specific reason, as I highlighted in my memo, that would better uh, suit the convenience of the public to change that date. So unless the board has a reason that would uh, better facilitate the convenience of the public for the purposes of the election, April 2nd, 2022 would be the default date. Uh, the second issue is when the town warrant should open. Uh, it's supposed to open the first week in December. That term's a little bit ambiguous. So you could set uh, December 3rd as the uh, as the beginning of, uh, I'm sorry, I believe December, oh, my calendar. First. Sorry. First, yeah. Wednesday. I believe, yeah, I believe December 1st is a Wednesday. Uh, the board could open it as early as that Wednesday or could wait until the next, uh, or, or could um, wait until Friday, whatever uh, date the board chooses to open it. And then I believe it has to close on January 28th, the last Friday in January. So really we just need a formal vote to set the election date uh, and to articulate a reason why we want to move it from that um, April 2nd date, and then secondly, choose essentially one date in December when the warrant's going to open, whether it's going to be December 1st, 2nd, or 3rd. The board doesn't have any questions. I think it's a relatively uh, straightforward vote on both items. Okay, thank you, Attorney Heim. I'll turn to the board. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, I believe, and I would ask um, to the chair, through the chair, that we need to have two separate votes on this. We can't do it all at the same time. Yes. Okay. Um, if it's appropriate, um, I'd be happy to make both motions. Um, the first motion would be to set the date for the 2020 annual town election of April 4th, 2022. And then the second motion would be to open the warrant on Wednesday, December 1st to close on 
Friday, to open on Wednesday, December 1st, 2021, to close on Friday, January 28th, 2022. So those would be my two motions. Mr. You need to unmute yourself, Mr. DeCourcy. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right. I was um, I just a point of clarification. You had said April 4th, and I think April 2nd is the first Saturday. So if you don't mind just making that modification. Um, no, no. I, I, I thought I said April 2nd. It might have come out the 4th, but it's definitely um, first motion to uh, date for the annual 2022 town election of April 2nd, 2022. Thank you, Mr. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very Chair. much. Okay, uh, Mr. Hurd. Second. Okay, Mr. Diggins. Oh, no, we have a mute problem there too. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it was early, I can still do that. Uh, I'm fine with everything. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Helmer. Let's do the best of us. No questions. Okay. Yeah, and I don't have any questions either. So on a motion by Mrs. Mahan um, for the town election on April 2nd and the opening of the warrant on December 1st and closing on January 28th. Um, that was seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Hine. Um, just so we're clear, uh, we're these are two separate, two separate motions. motions. Yeah, okay. that's, that's right. Yep. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmer? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Okay, and that will be reflected as two separate votes, Attorney Heim, in our. Okay, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep, it's on this one. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, all right, so that leads us to item 15 um, was a request for no parking here to corner sign on Amsden Street. Um, and we see there is a letter in the file, and I believe that the police department has also sent us a memorandum saying that the request is um, consistent with parking uh, regulations. So I will turn to the board on this. I don't think the proponent is with us tonight, Mr. Chapterline. Sorry, I was looking at the memo. Uh, let me, yeah. Uh, um... I believe they are. Yes, would you like me to? Promote? Sure. There we go. Oh, there you go. There we go. Hi. Good evening, Miss Mather. My name's Shamima Mather. We live at 38 Amson Street. This is my husband, Michael, and we've lived here for about four years. So thank you for adding us to the agenda. Um, I've had some par some traffic concerns um, for the four years that we've lived on this street. And okay. yeah, so uh, in short, uh, like many of the streets around here in East Arlington, Amson is a fairly narrow street. And on the west side of the street, there's already a no parking uh, zone there, right, to uh, allow space for cars to get in and out of uh, Amson to Mass Ave. Uh, um, but on the east side, uh, parking is allowed. And so we often find, you know, vans and in one case a semi truck uh, parked there, and it creates a traffic problem because if if a car is trying to exit Amson Street to get onto Mass Ave, uh, they essentially block the entire street. So if another car then wants to get onto Amson Street from Mass Ave, and you end up with a traffic backup on Mass Ave, uh, add in snow you know, when, the, when the plows uh, mm -hmm. drop the snow there in the drifts, uh, the street becomes a real choke point there at that at the intersection of uh, Amzen and Mass Ave. So we would like the town to put a no parking here to corner, uh, matching the other side of the street to open up uh, that space where Mass Ave and Amzen Street connect. Uh, and we did notice that some of the other nearby streets, for example, Trowbridge is two blocks away. They, they have a similar uh, no parking on both sides of the street. Uh, I think probably for the same reason. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, the, uh, the summary of our, our request. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Mather and, 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 and Mrs. Mather as well for that. Um, and I did note that there is a memo from the police department saying they have no objection to the request. That, that, that was a specific language. Um, so I will turn to the board for any questions, comments, or motions. Uh, and I will start with 
Mr. Diggins. I will be happy to approve this request. And, and as someone who lives in East Arlington and passes that intersection a lot, yes. it, I have not had that problem at that intersection, but I can relate to it. Be it on, <laughs> and so, so it's good not to have the cars blocking the pathway because, or blocking the view for a pedestrian because I me mean, first, it makes exactly. it for a pedestrian to see the car, uh, but also I me mean, the cars, I me mean, don't have to, like come right up to the the almost the intersection, thereby making it, it harder for the pedestrian to to cross the street. So it's just better all around. So thank you for bringing this to attention, and it's residents that work that make the town work better. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, and thank you for your patience tonight. You probably learned a little bit more about select board and town business than you planned on. <laughs> <laughs> waiting for this, but we appreciate it. And thanks for, for looking out for the safety of uh, people in your neighborhood. I second the motion and I'm happy to support it. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. I also wanna um, echo uh, my colleagues, Mr. Helmuth's comments. God bless you for <laughs> hanging in <laughs> to this meeting so long. Um, I, I would like to say you're welcome back anytime, but I totally understand if you're not frequent flyers or anything like that. But it's, seriously, I, I do appreciate one thing that um, is unique. Well, maybe not unique, but is a highlight of Arlington is that people who move here, um, residents and business owners really try to do the best um, for the neighborhood. And, and, and that's what both of you have done. So I definitely appreciate that. And I will be supporting uh, the motion by Mr. Diggins. I'm not sure, was there a second, Mr. Chair? Yes, uh, Mr. Helmuth. By Mr. Helmuth. It. Okay, I'll third, fourth, and fifth it. So thank you so much. Th thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Thank you for bringing this to our attention and happy to support this to create some uniformity with the streets that are in East Arlington. And I think this you've highlighted a significant safety concern and happy to be able to remedy this for you. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Yeah, and I also want to thank you for staying here with us. I think we should have given you Mr. Amstutz a spot tonight, but uh, that, that's for it's, board it's members a, who are here earlier. But a great it's, learning experience it's a way, about how the yeah, town it's a works. learning experience for us too. We, uh, it's uh, just in terms of how we set our agendas. But So thank you for staying with us and hopefully Thanks. you got something out of the meeting. Um, and I agree with my colleagues. I, I um, actually am familiar with Amstutz Street, but in advance of the meeting tonight, I drove down and exactly the problem you talked about, there was a a large pickup truck right on that eastbound side and had someone been turning from Mass Ave onto Amsterdam, it would have been a problem. So I'm also happy to support it. And I also, this is the type of thing where we have control over this site. We can make a traffic rule and regulation. We don't have to get approval from the state or, or work with another agency. So when we can act quickly on something, um, we like to do that. And, and I, I think we're gonna be able to do that tonight. So. Um, we have a motion by Mr. Diggins that was seconded by Mr. Uh, Helmuth, and I'll turn to Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Great. Thank you very much. And, thank you. And again, much. Thank thank you. you. Sorry just, just real, to keep you up two, so late. Yeah, just two quick points, by the way. Uh, being that we're just a couple of blocks from Town Cafe, we're very happy to see that Someone will be taking the same space. I get my tie take out for lunch now again. And uh, as former residents of Medford Street, we can vouch that that crossing Chestnut is is treacherous. So we've been there and experienced it ourselves. So thank you very much. Thanks for thank, everything. Thank guys. you both. Okay. Thank Good night. you. Good night. Okay. Uh, item 16 for discussion, future select board meetings. Right now, we are only scheduled through November. We have a meeting on November 22nd, and based on our earlier discussion, we may have a, a special meeting if, if, if things weren't for the re-precincting. So if we could take a look at our calendars, um, if anybody wants to suggest dates for December and January. Um, Mr. Diggins? Well, I think for... December, I mean, the, the 6th and the 20th, I mean. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. How does that yeah. look like the people nodding their heads? Okay, all yeah. right. And then, and then 
back in, do you want to do January next? Yes. Okay. And, um, and then for January, I'm going to suggest it, um, the 10th and the 21st. Because if we do the third, we then run into the 17th. So we're going to have a three week gap in there somewhere. If we do the third, then we probably wouldn't come back until the 21st. And I'm thinking, let's just give us a break. I mean, um, through the holidays and just like come back on the 10th and then do the 24th. Okay. Um, are, you, are you saying the 24th or the 21st, which is Friday, which I prefer not to do? Um, am I on the wrong bus? You know, you, you said third and 21st three times. I, I meant the 24th. I'm sorry, 24th. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. 10th and 24th. Okay. Yeah. And I think Ms. Myers on the line, I think she would appreciate not having to prepare an agenda on December 30th or December 31st for January 3rd. So um, right. are those dates okay with uh, the members? Okay. Yes. And one one additional thing, and it's a, this this would be more in the, the, the form of a, a separate meeting that, that Mr. Chapdelaine and I were talking today. Um, and due to various things that occurred over the summer, we never had our goal session. And I know it's late in the year, but we felt it would be helpful to have something to talk about what has taken place during the year and where we need to go. And, and Mr. Chapdelaine, I know we had talked about potential dates, um, I believe the, the first or second of December, but I want to check with you because I, I, I know you had a conflict one of the one of the dates. So maybe we could talk about that too, just as, as a goals night. I may have those dates wrong. So I, I, was I think the second in, was bad for you, right? The second was bad. I was honing in on the 30th. And then the, okay. the, the first, I'm, I'm also going to the League of Women Voters for, well, virtually for their annual holiday um, event. Okay. So I, that, I don't mean to only give one date, but if the 30th no, works, that would be a good date. Okay. And how is that from, is that, how is the 30th, Mr. Diggins? Likely, I'm very likely out of town on the 30th, which is why I, my, I had a negative reaction when the town clerk said the 29th or the 30th with respect to an extra meeting. I'm all for the extra meeting. We, I realized that we need it, it um, but uh, the 29th, we, it has just been a struggle to get the youth and young adult advisory committee, study committee off the ground. And we are, it seems like we're coming down to the 29th for that meeting. And so that's why it's like, oh my goodness, between 29th and the 30th, it just wouldn't be two worse days for me. But you know what? Um, you got four. You got four without me. And I'm fine if you do it without me and on this. I mean, it's not going to be one of those like, you know, three, two things. And, and so, so I don't want to stand in the way of you all meeting because I mean, I'm just kind of blocked out on those two days. I mean, for the goals, it'd be nice if I was there. But once again, I don't have to be. Okay. Well, I, I, how does... On the goals, now, I, I think it's good if, if we're all there. So, I mean, I, how about if we and we wanted to try to do it before the end of the calendar year? How does December the 7th look? It would require us to do two nights that, or I know the ninth, I believe, is bad for the town manager. The, how about how did the seventh or the eighth look, Mr. Chapdelaine? Um, sorry, let me put this right in front of me. So I'm looking here, I think seven, I'm supposed to have a Minuteman related meeting, but the eighth okay. and the ninth are both open. Okay. It, is there a preference on either one of those dates? Are those dates good? I, I just think it makes sense for goals to have all of us at the meeting so we can try to work around your schedule, Mr. Diggins. Sure, thanks. The, the ninth would be better? Okay, the ninth it's would nine. be better for you? Um, yes. We could do it at six. We could do it if you want to do it earlier. I, did, I mean, sometimes we've done those meetings I mean, a little earlier. On Wednesdays and Thursdays, I'm generally not available till about six thirty. I mean, I okay, so we could do it at seven if, if that's. Yeah. Okay, why don't we do it at seven, Mr. Helmuth? Was that okay with you, or did you have a? Uh, so just to clarify, that's that's December 9th at seven p.m. Correct. Correct. Yeah, that's fine with me. Okay, Mrs. Mahan. Um. Yes, that's fine. And then our next, the meeting in December after that is, is it the 20th? 20th. That's right. Okay. And I'll leave it to the chair, um, how that meeting goes in, in terms of tradition. Um, okay. I know the town manager's saying he's not going to any events. Um, and I'll leave it at that. 
Okay, we'll talk about that um, in in advance of that meeting. Okay. Um, all right, so we don't need a vote on this, but just for, for Ms. Meyer, for December, we will do December 6th and December 20th. For January, we'll do January 10th and January 24th. And we will have our goals, mid-year review, um, mid-year goal review on December 9th. Okay, so we don't need a vote on that. I will now move to okay, item 17. Can, can, I, can I just ask, I'm sorry. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. On yep. the goals meeting, can we set it from um, seven and nine? Yeah, sure. Seven and nine. I think we, that's more than enough time. If we get done earlier, that's fine. But I think seven and nine, if we could, would be okay. good for me. Yep. We'll Thank have you. an outside limit of two hours. Sure. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Uh, seven, item 17 through 20, correspondence received. Item 17, traffic calming measures on Overlook Road. Item 18, request for memorial for Stephen Cross Gray. Item 19, request for pavement markings on Everett Street. And item 20, comments regarding the affordable housing funding. Um, do I have a motion on that? I'll turn to Mrs. Mahan. I'd like to move receipt, um, refer item 17 to the chair either to town manager and TAC, um, ref, uh, refer item 18 to the public memorial committee, but I'd like to, I believe um, Mr. Stephen Gray is with us tonight. Um, if we could recognize him, um, refer uh, item 19 again to the chair, um, either to the town manager and TAC. So uh, out of all that, um, move receipt 17 through 20 and if it's appropriate to recognize Mr. Stephen Gray um, on agenda item 18. Okay, yeah, I see he's here with us. If Mr. Gray would like to address the board, um, that's fine. That, 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 uh, then thank you, Mrs. Mahan for noting, noting that. I don't, um, if he would like to, he could raise his hand or, or the town manager can promote him if you'd like to address us. Good evening, Mr. Gray. Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, Selectman Board, thank you so much for giving me uh, the few minutes today. I didn't have anything formally prepared, but uh, I certainly appreciate you taking this into consideration. Um, just as a background, my father was in business uh, in Arlington for over 40 years. Uh, his name is still part of the business that still is on Massachusetts Avenue, and he was a big believer in Arlington, and I just wanted to... Uh, I didn't even know if it was plausible, but I figured I'd reach out and see what the options were. And uh, I truly appreciate you taking this into consideration. So thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Gray. I will note I had some classmates who worked for your dad across the street from the high school and he employed a lot of high school students. So uh, thank you. And, and we will be referring this to the Public Memorials Committee. So thank, thank you very much for addressing us. Um, all right. So on a, do, do we have a second on Mrs. Mahan's motion? Yeah, I'll second that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Any comments from either Mr. Diggins or Mr. Hurd? No, okay. So um, on a motion on the, the four items of correspondence from Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Heim. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Uh, before I say yes, I would like to disclose that my son, and Stephen Gray were classmates and very good best friends going through high school. And uh, Stephen's mom, uh, Dottie Gray, was of my five years, two of the years as co-president of Bracket School. And his dad, Stephen Gray, was a potty amongst himself and he's missed every day. So yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Okay, um, next, and uh, we have new business, Attorney Hein. No new business. 
Mr. Chapdelaine. I'll, I'll be very brief with uh, three pieces of new business. One, uh, a tremendously hearty congratulations to Christine Bongiorno and her team for putting on the vaccination clinic on Saturday um, for uh, youth ages five to 11. Uh, we, via Christine and her team's great work, be came instantly the envy of the whole state. And I have been receiving texts and phone calls from mayors and managers asking how the heck we got those vaccines. And after we got them, how we put on a clinic so quickly. So, um, you know, lots of happy faces, both parents and children, and really an amazing effort to vaccinate 1,200 youth on Saturday. So I just want to publicly congratulate Christine, the team at HHS, the support she received from the schools, the fire department, the police department, um, really a community team effort with a great result. Um, beyond that, I did want to mention, uh, I know it was raised by uh, multiple speakers under uh, open forum, um, Chestnut Street it was really solely being held up by the need for MassDOT to review the plans that were approved by the select board as um, was discussed at that hearing before the select board. Um, DPW has forwarded those plans to the district office and with uh, coordination with select board member Mahan, um, we've both spoken to representative Sean Garbley who I learned placed a call to MassDOT today to also try to put a hurry up on that so we could start to make the improvements as were um, understandably pleaded for earlier in the meeting. Um, and additionally, uh, as was referenced earlier in the meeting, um, great efforts put forth um, by DPW, the planning department, and the contractor hired by DPW to implement the Appleton Street uh, markings in a very uh, expeditious manner. Um, still trying to figure out some things with the bollards and get some final things implemented, including some signage on Appleton Place to better delineate the new one-way traffic pattern. Uh, but overall, uh, I, I think a pretty, uh, pretty laudable uh, quick implementation of uh, what was passed by the board just in recent weeks. So that was all, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. No, no business. Okay, Mr. Diggins. No, no business. Mr. Hurd. No, no business. Mrs. Mahan. Yeah, I guess, uh, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, first, um, I, I've spoken with the chair uh, as well as probably all of my colleagues over whatever months, weeks about the selectman handbook. Um, our, our colleague, Mr. Greeley created it um, over the past five years, I'd say. There have been some housekeeping items that I've run by uh, town council and town manager, grammatic errors, type, typos, um, et cetera. But I did speak to the chair um, and most recently had a conversation with our colleague, Mr. Helmuth, who in his uh, review of it, um, uh, when he is running for select board, also um, said he had some uh, suggestions to it. So I've asked the chair and he's agreed between now and the end of the year to put the select board handbook on, on the agenda. Um, and I, I would ask my colleagues to uh, keep that in mind for any revisions or updates, uh, to ask any of my colleagues, Mr. Helmuth, that might want to <laughs> take on the uh, preceptor or scepter from Mr. Greeley to uh, move forward on that. And when we get to an agenda item, I have more thoughts on that. Uh, the other thing is, um, uh, I know the chairman, and if he wants to give a brief comment on this, that's great. If he doesn't, that's okay. Um, and I'll skip on my last um, item because I know we have executive session, but um, we, uh, myself and the chairman and, and I CC, we, we CC the town manager, uh, received communications from Jackie Duffy from ever source regarding double polls. Um, and I don't know, if, Mr. Chairman, if you could speak to that briefly or if you want to um, carry that over into another meeting. Yeah, if you want to, I, I, I will speak to, do you want, if you have anything else, if you want to speak no, to that. No, that's it. I'll, I'm going to save okay. everything else for another meeting. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Simon. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with that just very briefly. And, and we'll say Jackie Duffy held up her and she 
The next day, she sent out emails to uh, individuals at Eversource and at Verizon saying that she attended, our, <coughs> excuse me, attended our meeting and that the, the poll on Mass Ave and uh, at the corner of Mass Ave and Adams absolutely should be replaced quickly. That's an, a Verizon issue. Um, I have spoken to Mr. Chapdelaine and there has been some dialogue with Verizon, but there will be more dialogue this week with their government, government affairs person um, to, to really emphasize the double poll issue, but the, the, the one on Mass Ave in particular, which is, which is a, a threat. So there, there has been some contact. I would like some more contact back from Verizon, but at the same time, there's, there has been reach out and there will be some more this week on, on that point. So I um, wanted to mention that briefly. Also wanted to congratulate Christine Bongiorno and Natasha Warden and the Health and Human Services staff. And when Christine was before us earlier this year, she expressed frustration when the senior clinics were being taken away from the communities and, and the mass sites were being um, coordinated. And, and I know she, she realized that that is the better way to do the clinics for the elder population and, and for our younger population. And she got ahead of every other community in the Commonwealth and put on a hugely successful um, vaccination clinic, got a lot of young people vaccinated, which is so critical. Um, and there, there, there may be another one that's, that's coming up, but it was really a, a proud day for the town. And we all heard um, our gratitude and um, all the people from, from town um, staff who, who also were working at that uh, clinic and, and uh, for the time that they put in. So um, that's great. Last thing I want to say before um, is part of uh, new business is we made two appointments tonight to the open space committee. Our current open space plan was for 2015 to 2022. We take that plan very seriously. Within that plan, there are 19 references to the Mugar site. One of the statements in that plan is the 17 acre Mugar property remains the highest priority goal for acquisition and protection as open space and flood water storage. Um, we all know what the situation is right now. There is a decision pending before the ZBA on a proposal there. The ZBA has, um, has to follow chapter 40B and has to follow the regulations there as far as the decision is concerned. But once that decision comes out, I think we have to look long and hard as a community um, to, to how far any decision or what's going in there departs from our goals, which was a public purpose, um, and, and uh, to, to really think long and hard what we do as a community um, after that happens. I think it's premature to talk about that specifically right now because the decision is pending, but I did think it was topical because of the appointment we were making and the fact that that uh, open space report will be updated, but the, the fact that 19 times it was mentioned and adopted shows the importance of that site to the community. So that is my new business tonight. Um, we now have an executive session and um, I mentioned to a board member too that I thought we would go early tonight. Of course, it's 11-11, it's I apologize, but you never know what happens with a meeting once you start. Um, so for executive session, we have three items. Um, Item A, to consider the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property, the Mugar conservation parcel. Item B, to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law or federal grant and aid requirements, which is the approval of executive session minutes of September 27th, 2021, and October 25th, 2021. And item C, to conduct a strategy session in preparation for contract negotiations with non-union personnel, the town manager, and or conduct contract negotiations with SAM. Um, do I have a motion for the executive session? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could, I'd like to make a motion on um, what you have previously stated under A, B, and C, and that when we come out of executive session back into public session, it's purely for the purposes of adjournment. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hurd. Okay, so we have a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Hines. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Reluctant, yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 
Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mrs. Mon? Yes. Unanimous vote. The board is now in executive session.